Shut up and sit down. Do you? Hmm? Hmm. And where you should not. For my ally is the Force. And a powerful ally it is. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us. And binds us. Luminous beings, though we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere, yes, even between the land and the ship. Welcome, Broskis, to the Frugal Force. My name's Abolished, and tonight we are talking soil. And I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a few other, uh, some new faces joining us on the panel tonight. We have uh, Mike from Greener Grow Spaces. I got that name right? Greener Grow Spaces, right? Got your mute. You got it close, man. It's Green Grow Spaces. Green Grow Spaces. I do it to our show all the time. I swap around the bro and the grow. Thanks, Abolished Farmer. <laughs> there it is. Michael. And we also have a, a new face from the Frugal Force chat, one of our Padawans, Narwhal, joining. I don't know if his mic's on or not, but he's got an awesome logo there. But uh, let's uh, go around and introduce everybody. I, I already uh, mentioned you, Mike. Why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? All right, guys, uh, my name is Mike. I live up in Canada, so it looks like we've got quite quite an international uh, cast now. Hey, okay. uh, originally from Toronto, born and raised there, and moved out to Vancouver, BC, uh, about a year ago, which is like the mecca of cannabis here in Canada. Um, I've been I've been growing cannabis since uh, probably since about fifteen ish or so, and I'm over forty now. Uh, uh, but I've initially just turned on to cultivation, not necessarily cannabis, and just, just you know, uh, gardening in general by my grandmother. I was born to a single mom, and my grandmother had like three really, uh, really amazing, massive gardens that each like each functioned in a different, each like served a different purpose. Um, and I really got to learn um, kind of like the, uh, the the nature of soil and the the relationship between um, you know everything, the entire ecosystem uh, through that experience, which was which was awesome. Uh, so anyways, currently now I'm uh, uh, what they call a master grower <laughs> for, for a company that's an application for a micro production company and a nursery. But we all know that the plant is the master grower and we're just the students, right? Um, but that's it. So and then and then leapfrogging off of that, I'm also an instructor at Mount Royal University uh, for commercial cannabis production. And I'm fucking excited to be here, man. <laughs> Thanks for having me, bro. It's well deserved, man. Because there's something that I've always noticed with a lot. Because you're one of, I consider you one of the original no-till gurus, and there's something that sets you apart from the other no-till guys. Is you had consistent finishes. You actually finished your harvest. There wasn't always some kind of problem or something that uh, 
happen to pop up midway through or right at the end. So props to you, man. I'm, I'm glad you're doing good. Thanks, man. Yeah, there are definitely numerous challenges out there, and I'm not going to, you know, stand here and say that I'm some expert. I mean, like I say, we're all students, and I mean, the truth is we know more about, like, the stars above than the soil below our feet, right? And we're all kind of learning, and we're all tripping over our own feet as we're trying to complete the harvest. So, I mean, it's, it's fortunate, man. And uh, I don't think our, one of our other new guy here is here yet, but Narwhal, you're getting missed again. So go ahead and go around and uh, Spartan Grown. What's up, everybody? I'm Spartan Grown. Um, I don't know what the fuck else I'm supposed to say here. I'm already high. <laughs> <laughs> Just what show you're not on. Oh, shit. Uh, I'm not on the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> You'll find me, uh, yeah, all over uh, YouTube, mostly at the Mission Bros Grow Show. Uh, also, the GML Show, but not lately because my son has football games on Fridays, so I don't know. But it's talking about maybe changing the time, so maybe I'll be, be able to jump on there. And then uh, the Cheap Home Grow podcast, I also jump on there with the growing with my fellow growers. And then other Future Cannabis Project and other little ones here and there. But you can find me on Instagram if you need to get a hold of me. That's the best place. Just... Uh, DM Spartan Grown, and I'll get back to you when I can. Next time I see you, man, I'll give you a, a gaming headset so you can jump on GML while you're in the bleachers. Yeah, I think I'll get some dirty looks. I don't know if I can get away with that one. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't go over too well. And to my left here, we got the porch farmer. How you doing tonight? Pretty good. How you doing? And uh, glad to be here. You can find me on Instagram, Porch Farmer. Follow along my journey. Frugal Grow. Nice to see you. And down below me, we got the Iron Man himself, Big Jar Grows. How you doing tonight? All right. Big Jar Grows. IG. Follow along. Doing the frugal way with these guys. Learning how to do this. So far, we're going good. Hell yeah, Red Setter Farm. How's your night going, man? Oh, it's going great, man. How's everybody doing tonight? I am Red Setter Farm. I'm a Michigan caregiver. Um, my Instagram is at Red Setter Farm. Uh, it's mostly comprised of photography, music, and uh, cannabis. Um, I'm into natural medicine and long walks on Michigan coastline. So cheers, everybody. Happy to be here. And the man himself, Green13. What's good? Hey, what's good? Great to have Mike along. Um, I'm Green13. You can find me on Instagram under Green13. And you can find me here. Are we on Wednesdays? I know we I know it's Wednesday today. It'd be Not Saturdays. It'd be Saturdays. <laughs> and here on Saturdays. That's just in the future. <laughs> Not really. Maybe. It's classified. Yeah. So yeah, tonight we're wanting to talk about soil and not just uh, anything specific, but what each one of us thinks would be a very important thing for people to look at and what we want to highlight. So I want to go around and just each person uh, go ahead and talk about their topic. I know uh, Mike and Spartan, you guys were talking a little bit right before we went live. If you guys wanted to keep going with that. Yeah, if we want to rewind it a little bit. Uh, go ahead, Mike, take it away with, uh, we were talking about um, teas. And you're saying how there's like three different types of tea, or at least the three teas that you're talking about was uh, a nutrient tea, uh, an enzyme tea, and a microbe tea. We'd only talked about the microbe tea, but you can start it off again. Yeah, Absolutely. So you guys hear me? You got me? It's my first time on yeah. Zoom, first time on the show, so I don't know if my buttons are working. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. Right. So we began talking about uh, just essentially I think I think one of the most important things to kind of consider as a new grower uh, when you're growing in living soil specifically, right, is uh, ultimately it, it ties back to the fear. Okay. So there's a lot of fear on behalf of growers out there, whether you're growing in soil, whether you're growing synthetically, it doesn't matter how you're growing. I noticed that there's a trepidation and, and that fear works its way 
into trying to diagnose problems right away. There's an issue here. I've got a toxicity here. I've got a this problem there, a deficiency there. Like, what is the what's the problem, right? And <laughs> you have to change your approach when you're growing living soil and when you're growing synthetic. And you know, we've we've most of us have probably tried all different types of grow. And if not, I recommend doing it all because you're going to see, you're going to really, really learn a lot about this plant <laughs> and a lot about yourself, right? And about the industry specifically and where the money is trying to be made and where it isn't. But ultimately, at the end of the day. What I'm trying to say is that it's very easy to go in and think, okay, I'm seeing a perceived nutrient deficiency, right? Like, let's say you get yellowing, typical yellowing from below on fan leaves. Okay, my God, I've got a, a nitrogen deficiency is what I'm thinking, right? Well, what, what does a normal synthetic grower do? They go to the store, right? Or they go to the Amazon these days, I suppose, <laughs> and buy, uh, you know, a nitrate-based fertilizer, right? And they just pump that shit and they fucking feed that like it's foie gras. And, uh, and... The thing is, when you with soil, the goal is to maintain like a proper and healthy soil balance as well as texture and consistency, right? So when we're talking about all of this, you're talking about the nutrient levels in the soil. We're talking about like the cation exchange capacity of the soil, right? We're talking about the breathability of the soil, right? Whether it's actually alive. So, you know, the, again, the the the, the knee jerk reaction is to go and purchase something and add that nutrient to your soil because that's what the plant needs without maybe thinking that there might be another problem, right? Like maybe there is enough nitrogen in your soil, but your microbiology isn't on point, right? Because when we're talking about living soil, and actually when we're talking about soil, I, did, I really think that soil requires life in it to be soil. Otherwise, it's just dirt. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you haven't had those rises and falls of populations, if you haven't had the protozoa, you know, and the arthropods and the, and then the flagellates and ciliates doing all of their things, and you haven't had those... Um, like, like generations, right, of death and humus creation at the end of the day, then you're not really, you're not really working with a soil. You, know, you can call it super soil, but no offense. I mean, but it's technically, it, super soil can become a soil in my opinion, but right off the bat, I think if it doesn't have all of those dynamic characteristics that you would expect that you need in a living soil, then, I mean, we're talking about two different things, right? So, so <laughs> we're talking about teas now, guys, there's different things, right? There's like, foliar teas, and then there's like soil-based teas, essentially. There's two kind of ways to understand teas, right? So in order to maintain like an ideal soil balance, you really don't want to be fucking around with the soil composition, right? And so really like the first thing that you should do or that I would do if I see a perceived nutrient deficiency, let's say, is I would make a foliar tea. Actually, first what I would do is I would make sure that my, my, uh, my microbiology in my soil is on point. Right. So basically my, uh, you know, my soil, my humus layer needs to have been moist, like constantly moist the entire time. Right. And if it isn't, if I fear that perhaps things have died for whatever reason, then I will go and I will I will brew uh, like a worm castings tea or something like that. Uh, try to try my best to repopulate that soil. I know there are some <laughs> technical issues there. It's Spartan grown can speak to the issue, right, of a word, let's say, a, bi a microbial-based tea application to soil. No, I think, uh, I think worm casting tea I'm 100% on board with because if nothing else, I mean, there's a ton of mi microbial action in life in worm castings, one. But two, there's also a lot of nutrient there. There's a lot of calcium that comes with uh, worm castings. There's a lot of nitrogen that comes in with worm castings. It all depends on what you feed them. But you, it is a, it's a nutrient tea also. Um, I still think it's better just to top dress the, the worm casting than to dilute it in water. But if you are trying to spread that worm casting, you know what I mean? You don't have enough, you don't have the, the production on the worm casting side to match the production on your grow side, then yeah, of course, brew a tea to try to stretch that and, and try to evenly apply it instead of just charge one, you know, one side with it and then leave the other without. I do think it's a better idea to uh, use the water at, at that point. The reason I... The reason I personally shy away from teas, this is me personally, is because I don't have a microscope to be able to test my teas and make sure that they're um, a good tea. You know what I mean? That I didn't brew a bad tea somehow. So because I don't have a way of checking whether it's good or bad, and, and I don't know what, what I'm doing with it, I prefer to just use the top dress because it's far less uh, risky. Without yeah, definitely. And so, and, definitely. And so what about a wash? I, I've, I've stopped doing teas, but what I've been doing an awful lot of is worm washes, kelp washes, where I'm yeah. just taking a litre a bottle and giving it a good old vigorous shake 
and then it's an application thing. Later, that's that's so essentially an extract. Yeah, it's right? an extract. It, 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 it kind of is a tea. Yeah, it's a tea. It's an extract. It's all of those things. But but it, what it hasn't done is bubbled for 24 hours, and so there's no fear there for me. Either right. spraying it on, or putting it in the soil, or putting it down under the soil. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, that yeah, 100. percent Those extracts, I'm a hundred. I'm a fan of those also. Those those are uh, you know that's like when it rains outside, and you're just collecting that. Bingo. And then one one thing I want to point out about that again, the fear with the worm casting tea specifically is you guys may have heard those different brew parameters like 24 hours to 36 hours for a brew, right? It's like okay, well. What is it? Is it 24? Is it 36? How do I know? How don't I know? Is it with a microscope that I know? Or what? Is, right. it, your, is your nose? And, and like, are, we, are we fungal after 24 hours? And that's still right. something else, but not the well, same? Well, I mean, first of all, are you is the food in the tea the right type of food to create the fungus that you need, right? Because bacteria and fungi both reproduce off of different types of uh, like uh, complexities of sugars, right? right. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is what I've learned. I, again, uh, just basically kind of doing this for years and years and years uh, is that uh, generally, if your temperature in your room is cooler, right, you go to where you can go. Like, let's say when I say cooler, I mean like fucking 65 Fahrenheit. I'm trying to think in American temperatures here because I'm Canadian. <laughs> but like 65, right? Let's say it's something along those lines. Then you can brew it for I a little bit longer. I don't think we grows in Fahrenheit, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway, so <laughs> what I mean to say is that uh, generally if your room ambient temperature or the temperature of your brew is warmer, then you should definitely be brewing that tea for a much quicker amount of time. Like do not go beyond that 24-hour period because you're right. going to end up breeding those ciliates, right? You're going to end up breeding that like higher order magnitude predator uh, bacteria that's going to wipe out all of those other beneficials that you want, right? So it's kind of it's kind of the notion there with the worm castings. But, but just before we move on, so after that 24-hour period, the tea is then going fungal potentially, but it also is doing what you just said, and that's the danger point, yeah? Well, For your it, average gardener. Yeah, it depends on the, like he said too, it depends on the food source. For example, you know, the, the bacteria, they're really going to like those fast digesting things like uh, like a sugar, like a simple Sugars, sugar. Sugars, yeah. Yep. But uh, say, you know, one of the common components that a lot of people like to throw in a, a tea which is another thing that is a pet peeve of mine. I don't like combining. I like, if I want to do a targeted tea, I want to do that. I don't want to do four things. Um, but anyhow, they'll throw like, uh, say, uh, alfalfa. Yeah. Throw alfalfa in there because it's got tricantinol in it for one, which is, uh, uh, I guess, is it technically a plant growth hormone? I think yeah. It's, it's yeah. natural. Or like kelp, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, it doesn't kelp. matter whether it's natural. But uh, either way, the like the husk of the alfalfa and, and, and like the the more woody or lingon I think it is what they call it that content inside you know a bacteria can't even break that down so it's going to take a fungus to do it but it's going to take some time mm -hmm. I got a recommendation from Leighton Morrison and uh, from Kingdom Aquaponics and he said uh, it, with his studies with uh, Elaine Ingham he uh, usually between thirty to thirty six hours um, under you know using the microscope and whatever. Uh, was his best results with uh, brewing teas. So that was that I wrote that down and I, you know, put it in my head and that's what I did use to do teas and that's what I brewed my tea brew them brewed them in, but uh once I got more understanding and realized how much I didn't know <laughs> then because I don't have the right tool, you know what I mean? It'd be like trying to shoot in the dark at a target, you know. So right. so I realized I'm just kind of I know that my chances are still like 50 50 or I've got good chances of doing well, but still I'd really not take that chance and just do top dresses. But that's why I do my thing, but that's why I'm doing my thing. I'm not saying that's the only way to do things. It's just my opinion on it. So is there that's on the list like, though, isn't it? That microscope's on the list and that course. Yeah. <laughs> is there any kind of like strategy to say a longer tea? Like do people ever implement that? Cause it, it gets high in trichoderma right after it gets to like 36 hour point and other big, like, or not trich other like big protozoas, like the big guys that come in, like say, is it, would it be smart to maybe do a tea like that at the end of a run to break, help break everything down and, or say you had a bad, you're better off with an bombs. enzyme. Just because, again, just because consistency and the known. I'd rather go with an enzyme because I know that's going to be breaking things down. If I'm looking to break things down, 
I'd rather, I would rather go with an enzyme if you're looking at just like clear roots, things like that. Your microbes are going to be in your soil, hopefully, the whole time breaking things down. But um, if you're looking specifically, like you have an excess of, you know, dead material or something, I would look to enzymes. And what, give us an example. What would you use? I would top dress. Well, I do it all the time anyway, but I top dress pop every two weeks or so. Actually, I just kind of go by looks. Like once it disappears, then I put more on. But it's about every two weeks I'll put uh, malted barley. I top dress malted barley. Yep. Same here, religiously. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I use loads of it, but it goes in with wood, wood sawdust, so I can't see when it's gone. So I just keep chucking it in. Yeah. When it gets wet, it's <laughs> just good, keep good and fungal. Now, I actually shot a video, and uh, I, I think I put it in the Michigan Bros chat. I don't know if you saw it abolished. Um, if you want, I'll try to figure out how to send it to you. I don't know if you want to include it here or not. But uh, I got the mix from Build the Soil that was not only – it's Collect Miss Coots mix, so it's not just the malted barley. It's uh, seed sprout, too. So it's got the barley. It's got the uh, – uh, Some corn. Yep, some heir heirloom okay. corn and some hemp seed. And uh, I have uh, little baby hemp plants growing as a cover crop now <laughs> on, on some of my uh, plants I just put in the flower. <laughs> Probably have eight to ten little hemp sprouts in every, in every one of my pots. And uh, at first, when I first saw it, it scared the hell out of me. I'm like, what the? Where are these <laughs> seeds coming from? And then I'm, I got thinking. Happened to me like, last run. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. There's hemp seed in that cover crop. Because, of course, the first thing you think is, what is the last thing I did? You know, anytime you go get a problem, what's the last thing I did? Well, the last thing I did was top dress some of that uh, barley, but it's not just barley, it's hemp seed too. So I got looking at I got a lot of tomato plants as well, I think, from my compost. But um, <laughs> yeah. the trouble is with hemp, it's, it's, not a different, um, it's not a different root thing. So the, the soil's not, it's not a big bonus, really. I'd rather have a different type of plant in there looking for different uh, Well, what I'm going to do is, yeah, I'm worried about it. So I'm going to take them out, but... Uh, Ooh, I forget who, I think it was Dro. He recommended I just uh, chop them now while they're seedlings and just uh, eat them in my salad like a microgreen. That's what I was just going to say. So you should that's eat what them. I'm going to do. I'm just going to eat them up, so I'm going to have a nice salad. Yeah, I wouldn't see them as a negative as long as you get them out of there early, especially if it was a, you were starting the soil and you didn't have a soil test. It would help you uh, bioaccumulate all the heavy metals and shit out of there real quick. Well, that does make me want to eat them now, Abolish. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, before we get too far off the, the tease, I had I was wondering about another thing because I'm really interested in the, the leaf washes because that seems something simple that I can just do whenever. And is the whole reason why people do that is because we're, we're just harvesting the microbes off. We want the microbes off the outside of those leaves and we don't want to mess with the population at all by adding molasses and bubble in them or nothing. We want the, those pure microbes, right? Yeah, it's also a laziness thing, and it's also a safety thing, isn't it? Sorry, Mike, you go ahead, mate. No, 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 please, after you. I mean, Spartan and I do this all the time. It's about um, what you're prepared to do when you pick up and go in the garden. Like, let's do this now, or maybe I won't do this at all. Shall I set up a tea and get the bubbler out and do a whole thing and come back here? And now nah, I'm just going to go shake, shake probably won't do that action shake 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 and um pour that in with whatever i'm feeding it's or spray it down or whatever and the thing is i can do it at the drop of a hat all that stuff's just sitting around a sack of worm carts castings a sack of kelp just go it's just it's it's action gardening rather than turning it into some mm -hmm. long-winded thing that you don't end up doing very often like it. it sounds like a cool strategy but also with us, of course, we've all, for the frugal system, most of us are, are covering the top of our soil. So actually, it's difficult to be always top, top dressing. Um, and for me, particularly with having the, you know, the bottom section, it means that I can pour those microbes directly into the, into the bed, um, which, will which you could obviously do the same way you do with your saponins and all that good stuff. So it's a really good application method, is what it is. But yeah, then, it's so, a saver. So is tea. It's like some people don't want to wait. It's like sometimes you'll throw a clone in and say you're on like your whatever third or fourth run and it goes deficient. And it's not that it doesn't have enough food. It's just not established enough, you know, to find the food. The roots haven't got in there. It hasn't established, you know, it's uh, intelligence in the soil. So teas and stuff like that, 
you can throw those in there to get your instant green up if you're one of those people that want to stay pretty for Instagram all the time. <laughs> Right. And so uh, that was uh, that was the second, basically the second type of tea. I think we just kind of covered it there without officially introducing it was the enzymatic based teas. Right. So that's kind of I wanted to talk about or at least discuss three types. Right. So one would be the microbial based. Second one would be enzymatic based, which we've just hit on. And then the third would be uh, the nutritive, nutritive teas. Right. And in Spartan's um, position, he doesn't like to mix all of the three. And I, I totally understand where he's coming from. I also don't either. Um, you know, but then there are some people in some situations that just have to mix certain ones with others and things like that, right? But it's definitely when we're when we're looking at teas. Uh, again, I want to like emphasize how important it is to first be using these nutritive-based teas as foliars instead of applying them to the soil itself and thinking that there's something wrong with your soil and your soil is off, right? Like, really, the goal is to be growing microbiology in the soil, right? Like, that's what we're looking at when we're thinking of the soil. Uh, when it comes to leaves and foliars, uh, although, again, that's the nutritive teas. You can hit nutritive to the foliars. You can hit enzyme-based teas to the foliars. And you can hit microbial-based teas to the foliars. And that's probably one of the best applications of a microbial-based tea, right? Because, I mean, it's like it's like a real estate competition in a way, right? When you when you start hitting these for, for those new growers out there, you think to yourself, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people out there that say, you know, oh, don't be full of your feeding your your plants. You're going to spike humidity in the room, and the you know right around the leaf, the humidity is going to spike, and that's going to cause PM and all this other shit. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, there is definitely a relationship between you know dew point and PM, and also standing water and botrytis and things like that. But but when you apply a microbial based foliar to your leaves on the top and on the bottom of those leaves, those those they the, they they populate those microbes very. They populate that leaf surface itself right and they literally prevent the competing pathogens from establishing an effective foothold right and that's kind of that's the importance of a foliar microbial based tea in a no-till or a living organic system yeah a real easy way to understand that for everyone to understand is like imagine the leaf as the dinner table and the microbes are the people sitting at that fucking dinner table if all the chairs are full any other character that wants to show up, he ain't going to get no food. Love so, it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. he, he might, <laughs> really could he, he might pull your chair from under you and take your food, but at least that spot is still filled, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Bigger, <laughs> stronger. Yeah. yeah, for sure, 100%. But, yeah, it's going to give you – I mean, we're not going to say it's going to make it, uh, you know, 100% proof. The table doesn't make, get bigger. Yeah. yeah right. But, yeah, you, it makes it a hell of a lot better to, to – have the good guys sitting there or a known microbe rather than you know who knows what plus I, I swear to god even if you spray water on the plants they fucking love it <laughs> yeah, it's just go, like go put your uh, mums out in the rain go put your mums out in the rain and yeah. tell you everything it's just yeah, like nature they get that microbial do yeah to me I, I i look at it almost like a, you know i always do all these stupid analogies but it's like this solar panel you know if there's dirt and dust that could sit on top of those leaves and if you're giving it a nice spritz of water it's at least running that stuff off so that uh you know the light all the light can come in and come in and pull force you know that's the way i kind of look at it right it's another, it opportunity. Well, it's another opportunity to be looking at your plants it's another opportunity to make sure you've checked every space in your room you can go ahead and put your dehumidifier on and manage your stuff you know <laughs> It's really yeah, something. I think they love we, the humidity of the rain, though. My plants are out there getting rained on right now, and yeah. <clears throat> every day I check on them. The last few days, they keep getting rained on, and the flowers just keep tripling in size. Like they just keep fattening up, fattening up, fattening up. Um, I don't know. I, I keep my plants cleaned up. I'm not too worried about botrytis or anything. I think the plants are natural, have the natural defenses. They'll be all right as long as we get to dry out. The I think positively, I mean, let that do my work for me you, your genetics are pretty smart red they'll know what's going on over on your sides right now uh, I, would I selected I, I selected from last season uh from last season's outdoor the ones that that didn't mold up or anything so that's the right. um 
you know, that's the majority of my outdoor crop right now. And those are the ones that are actually, t- they're, they're very rain resilient. Um, and, you know, the rain just helps bulk them up. Uh, got a couple other ones that, you know, I mean, I, I mean, without the rain, I'm seeing just a little bit of PM here and there. PM, I'm, I'm kind of expecting a little bit of PM here and there just because we've had some serious cold temps and whatnot outdoors. But <clears throat> mm-hmm. a healthy, healthy uh, root zone and a healthy, healthy plant is going to create the defenses that that plant needs to not load itself full of um, powdery mildew and botrytis. And I'm not, as I'm out there, I'll, I'll pluck those leaves. When I see a little bit of powdery mildew early in season, I'm plucking it. If I start to see it late in season, I'm still trying to pluck it and get it out of there. As long as I see it not getting into the flower and everything like that and not spreading, I'm kind of okay. Uh, as far as it goes, I mean, I'm about a week out right now from harvest. So, as lo- I mean, any PM that I'm seeing on there, which isn't much, I'm just kind of getting all washed away by the rain anyways. Uh, I'll go out there in a couple of days. I'll probably see a little bit more. But you know what? It's about to be harvest time. And as long as I keep plucking, it shouldn't take over the flowers. It shouldn't get inside the flowers. Uh, it's like tips of leaves, things like that. Spotty, spotty little shits. You know what I mean? You can see those pieces like that. And um, powdery mildew <laughs> is not detrimental to people, I don't think, unless you have a compromised like lung issue. But uh, right. I mean, so if it's not, you know, if it's, if you see, like, I see some people want to cut their plant down because one family had us like literal, uh, you know, a dime size spot on it or something. I'm like, dude, <laughs> just cut that leaf. <laughs> like, just cut that fucking leaf off, man. You'd be yeah. all right. And, and we have, we have the ability here in Michigan and, and hopefully you can, um, I don't know, try to get to Michigan with your product. If you have to, to uh, try to get a sample tested, if you have to, you know, if you do have an, if you're immune compromised or anything like that, we have the ability to test our samples for microbials, fungus, anything like that that might compromise that immune system further. So um, utilize those resources. Don't freak out and chop your plant down, harvest it, finish it off, trim it out. You see anything suspect, get it tested, tested anyways. You know, you should get samples, homogenous samples tested regardless, but you know, if, if you feel, you know, fishy, something else, get that piece tested, you know? <clears throat> um, yeah. Don't chop your plant down because you see a little spot of PM or anything like that. Uh, the botrytis, It'll happen, but rain isn't usually the issue of botrytis. It's usually lots of wind opening up those flowers. The rain gets smacked inside there, and then it can't get out. <clears throat> Otherwise, I mean, it's um, probably that moisture got in there a long time ago, actually, or, or it's trying to get away. the rain off. Maybe you really went out there and you started shaking your plant because you it rained, and you went out there and you started shaking your plant. That's what gave it botrytis in the first place, and it wasn't yeah, actually the rain. Bad, you know right. what I mean? Because you opened up that plant and it. Look, the plant's got waxes and it's got oils and it's got all these resistance mechanisms to turn it like it's basically rain decks on your windshield you know what i mean it beads up and it falls right off you know it almost isn't even there uh that's kind of what's going on at least in my mind that's kind of what's going on on the plant uh is why that stuff's there that's exactly what waxes are we probably don't help probably everything we do probably doesn't help you're seeing a lot of people well, blowing with Big yeah. blowers and probably just leave it because you Some see pools, pools of water. Yep, yeah. Yep. I mean, we were touching something else, and we touched that, and that was the botrytis that it got. Um, yeah, it, it would have just time. evaporated. I mean, yeah. generally, the plant should, you got to keep them clean. I mean, if you don't have good airflow, if you don't have, I mean, all of the, you got to check all those marks off, you know, outdoor. But I'm growing under a canopy of sunflowers right now, and my biggest negative that I'm seeing is just make sure that I get any sunflower debris off my flowers. Don't let my flowers grow around that sunflower debris because that's where I'm going to have botrytis. You're going to get botrytis where you have contamination. You have worms. You have bug shit. You have anything like that. You know what I mean? Um, you're going to get contamination. I mean, I thought we were talking about teas is one of the best things for all of this stuff, right? Botrytis and um, right. uh, PM. If you can cover your leaves in, in, in that stuff, those spores, they struggle to, to compete on those surfaces. Yeah, I mean, if you happen to live in New Zealand, there's a, a native uh, microbe there called Eulocladia mudomansi, which is uh, like a botrytis, just devours botrytis like like this. Ah. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's the active ingredient in that botrytis. Or bot, there's a it's a product out there like a botrytis stop product or something like that. But anyways, yeah, the same guys that produce Millstop have a product to produce uh, to kill botrytis, and it's called Eulocladia mudomansi. So get your hands on that. Yeah, man. Yeah, and it definitely, it's like, a, from my understanding, it's the freestanding water, right? That freestanding moisture that allows botrytis to get itself in. So as long as you've got the combination of that freestanding moisture and the actual pathogen itself, then, you know what I mean? As long, and so, and so, hey, and therein, lies, therein lies, 
and so but that's like that's what it's all about is the selection process on the growers right we have to be attentive right as growers we have to be attentive when we're selecting and as breeders we have to be doubly attentive to these things right this is very important and these days so many people are smashing paul into pistol calling themselves breeders putting cannabis out on the market and it's just fucking <laughs> it's getting destroyed by pm it's getting destroyed by botrytis like it's just really really weak riles so long story short can we get a yay for acid rain <laughs> and <laughs> and killing botrytis i'm sorry killing uh pm like <laughs> literally you're getting like it's like a natural sulfur burner <laughs> coming down vinegar and uh, yeah if, yeah exactly. that's another thing that can help you with if you if you have pm you can just actually ph up your water up you know yeah I mean? you just hit it with a high ph and, and that'll drive it just, out just that oh, alone. i gen genuinely used to spray vinegar a vinegar solution just to just to make it acidic or maybe it was a uh, baking powder there you go baking soda make it yeah, uh, yeah and also those kelp like out. a powdered kelp full if you get a kelp powder sort of thing you'll find it that also the ph of that spikes right up sometimes that gets up to like 10 even right like an up and above 10 so you barely even have to you wouldn't have to pH the absolute that. the absolute best thing to do if, if you are doing outside and you're worried about, or you've struggled with uh, any kind of fungal, really, um, just do uh, regular foliar sprays of a silica with some kind of a spreader, you know, some kind of a, like a yucca, like you mentioned before, or, or some something like that. Optic foliar has a product, transport, anything like that. But silica always... Soap nuts. <clears throat> soap nuts. Right. Yeah, soap all the nuts. The thing is, is... Uh, with, you know, you're going to get the stronger plant anyway with the silica. You're going to get um, less water and more pectin in the plant. So when they send the, the fungus sends its, uh, we'll call them roots. They're not really roots, but whatever. It sends those roots in to try to go for the water. It's not getting it. So mm -hmm. it just shrivels up and dies. Um, and it spikes your uh, pH up real high. So a lot of the fungals get wiped out from, the, from that foliar too. So, I mean, if you wanted to do like at least one foliar, do a, a silicate and, and some kind of a spreader. Definitely. And then, I mean, I, I would I would throw one last thing in there. I would throw fulvic acids in, personally, uh, specifically yeah. through the foliar. I mean, if we're talking about soil applications, then it would be a humic acid, right? But the fulvic acids are so Worm small. castings. Worm castings yeah. covers all of that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just chuck some castings in, guys. It's got the perfect measure of humic and fulvic. It's done. Yeah. Don't buy go product. wrong, guys. Seriously. I mean, and like, it's super easy to get yourself worm casting. It's just get a smart pot, get a bunch of manure, get the, get the shit that you would normally put in your soil, right? Like, I don't use newspapers and I don't use these kinds of things. I use what I would normally put in my soil, in my food bin, My, I, but I use less kelp, right? My understanding is that worms aren't the biggest fans of too much kelp, right? So, you know, and then the worms just go through over the course of time and fucking cold compost that shit. Cover it in calcium carbonate. Bob's your uncle, man. It's um, right. also uh, kelp. You have to watch if you add a lot of kelp. You have to watch your sodium levels, especially if you're not if you're you know if you're not throwing out your soil and you're reusing it over time, but you're constantly top, top dressing or adding kelp product. You got to watch out for those sodium levels. It can really get out of whack easy and quick. And I love worm okay. bins. I love cool. my own worm bin, and I love to just. I use, uh, I actually recycle, uh, I do use newspaper and paper, but it's just recycled from what they send me for free. <clears throat> Stuff I'd normally throw away. Right. So I just, I just, I shred it. And then I have a, uh, a leaf blower that I turn to a vat, you know, the vacuum and it mulches leaves. So I take all my leaves from outside and I feed my worms that too. And I'm working on my worms just ate 10 male plants. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, all my leaves. Yeah, they get a lot of my leaves too. Uh, yeah. But now I'm working on, I was doing leaf mold. So just putting, collecting my leaves in five gallon buckets and letting them, you know, kind of mold up on their own and yep. then feeding that to the worms. But now, yeah. now I'm putting them all in a 55 gallon drum and populating that with blue oyster uh, mycelium to uh, break that down, uh, you know with a fungal presence. So my, right. my hope is, is then take that fungal compost, feed that to the worms, and then I'll get a fungally dominated worm casting. But, uh, you know, that's going right, to be, right. it's going to be years wow. down the line. But, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's like, well, terroir driven out. worm castings. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> shout out to Clactimus Coot. I can't take all, all the credit. He, it was his, oh, uh, yeah. it was from so, his, his, uh, he, he told me I should do that. And I'm running with it. Perfect. Yeah. So I the would say, any advice Clactimus Coot has to offer. <laughs>
<laughs> so defoliate, take your old spent D's bag, throw it in a barrel, and let it do its thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I did. Yeah. And are you, uh, Spartan Grown, are you adding rock dusts to your to your leaf mold yes, periodically so as you go through as well? I actually uh, add them to the top of my worm bin. Uh, I, because uh, I'm using. We talked about this all afternoon. Funnily enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I use. Uh, I use. I put it through the worm bin because, for one, the worms always like to have a little bit of grit for their for their guts, and so I add it to the worm bin and I add it through. I use to what's called craft blend, and it's from Build a Soil, and it's basically how you just described everything I put in my soil. It's that kind of a thing, and all in one. It's got your, you know, malted barley. It's got gypsum. It's got the rock dust, the salt specifically. It's got, you know. Uh, I don't know, three or four different types of calcium. I don't, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. I can't list it all off, but there's a lot of the good stuff. And I just give that, you know, I, I just put that through the worm bin too, because essentially that's going to go into my soil. So I want it to be just as good. You know, I really top dress with my worm castings. Um, and then they get all my inputs. I don't really top dress my inputs because uh, green 13 was saying how, it is kind of a pain in the butt to pull your mulch layer back to, to top dress. So uh, I don't, I try to reduce that how many times I have to do that by just uh, using my worm. I feel bag. like the top dress is worm food anyway. That's for them to come get and deal with on spot. Because right, but it, it, it's it also, probably isn't going to. It is, but it's also serves a purpose. Is the, the moisture retention is really the, the biggest oh, thing. Oh, that's what it's there for for me, for the wicking bed. <laughs> right. It, it yes. doesn't even work properly if you don't like have a thick mulch. Right. The, better, the thicker, the better. I like actually, I started using my old uh, branches. I'm just using my old branches in there right now. Get so a good layer when I, when I the plant, I just put them down. Definitely, man. That's exactly it, man. Yeah. Yeah. I use my spent, like I use the leaves that I defoliate with and create teas from it anyways. And actually, which is another great source of instant enzymes. You'll notice if you throw your cannabis leaves in a tea in a bubbler, right away, the very first thing that comes is all those bubbles that foam you'd expect from an enzymatic based tea mm -hmm. um yeah and then i'm using my stems as in place of what people would normally use their hay for right just use the stems i mean it's what would normally happen <laughs> right exactly that's 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 what my thought was too and it's a little bit i still think straws the absolute my favorite you know uh, if i had a nice clean straw that i knew was organic and didn't get crap sprayed all over it yeah. i would like straw but a straw which doesn't exist that, probably yeah well i know a guy but yeah it's <laughs> The straw doesn't last forever. Overspray, but yeah. I, I even started growing grass as a top cover so I could cut it down and have my own sort of hay. But yeah. as it happens, I've I've now gone for for sawdust and I also th um, wood shavings and I think um, what Bolish uses as well the um, the rice hulls. Yeah, I think is they're both great. Yeah, I like my leaves to go in my worm bin. The trouble with hay, I find, or straw Spartan is. Um, Insects kind of love it. See, I it, found it, the opposite. Oh, I yeah? The opposite. Cover crops, I get the insects. If I use a straw, I don't get any. Right, so wood shavings over is what I was saying. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Wood yeah. shavings would also bring a... I would I would worry about wood shavings, honestly, only because they're already kind of in a fine... already broke down. Um, I wouldn't go heavy with them is what I'm saying because uh, they're going to... When they do break down, it's going to be a uh, fungal that's going to have to do it. And it's going to require nitrogen to do so. So it's going to kind of like be a nitrogen sink. And if you don't have yes. a cover crop like a nitrogen fixer or something like that, it's going to you know, be something that you're going to have to be putting in somehow. You know, probably worms. So I things. will with fish. And we, you oh, and I fish. have had this because go. I, okay. I got the problem at the other end. But it's such a great co cover because it's regenerative. The sawmill gave it to me. It, they're big shavings. This is not dust. There's shavings from a planer and okay um, that's better that'll be better wow. yeah that's right it will break down but very slowly but what it really is is to to cover the tops uh, yeah that's why I, I was I thinking it was be, a dust i want to be the no-till hippie but indoors <laughs> when i cover that bottom you can't see under there nothing could grow under there it's too dark for 50 days and if it's not i failed so unfortunately it's got to be a a, a a mulch rather than a, a green mulch Actually but we didn't talk about so soil at all, did we yet? Well, well you want that green mulch early and then the brown mulch late anyway, so. That would be great. That would be right. great. But that's another one of those, will I do it? Will I not bother? Right. I am going to have to rename the episode, but it's been great. Like, I, I, <laughs> I love what you I mean, 
I love that you guys hit on the foyer specifically because we, we basically spent the first two seasons just talking about building that soil and building the intelligence of the system. You know, making sure that you're producing the secondary metabolites to resist and uh, PM and all the stuff that we're talking about right here. But when you start bringing in the foliars and then you've got your CO2, those plus ones to your epic rating armor. Hit them those things Boss, really when you do frugal, eat. there's nothing else to do. You've got a foliar. Otherwise, you might as well sit on the couch because <laughs> it's, it's all done. <laughs> like, I need yeah. to be involved. Can well, we water work. every day? Nope. Can we? Nope, it's all taken care of. Defoliate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get another tent because you can do some trimming. And... Yeah, get autos. Get a side hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I really think that's the, uh, the true power of, of the frugal build is it frees you up with time. And of course, any grower with passion doesn't sit on his ass when he has time. He, he pushed that into something else that's going to help us grow. So instead of buying the worm castings, he makes his own worm castings. Or instead of you know, I don't know. There's so many counts. And then better castings. Then we feed better yeah. worm castings. Then yeah. we'll go yeah. to harvest or you our can go, own kelp. And... Yeah, or you can go in any direction. I mean, you know, I happen to like the worms, but anybody else could go like KMF. They could go and make, oh, I want to make my own ferments and I want to go collect wild, you know, wild collect at the uh, wherever uh, my own nutrients by picking them up from plants that grow naturally and, and fermenting them myself. You know, that's not really the route I'm going, but uh, that's just, there's just so many rabbit holes you can go down. As long as you want to invest the time, you're going to get back rewarded with uh, the saved money at the end. So you, you're just trading your time for money. And experiment. I've tried to spend. Like, like, oh, oh, I've got a question. Go I've got a question. I'm sorry. I just I know I talk too much, but when we're doing K and F, which I don't know an awful lot about, are we still feeding microbes, or are we? Is that chelated? Are we actually yes. feeding the plants at that point? They're still, yeah, they're still microbes, but they're anaerobic microbes. Yeah, so is that, That's I mean, is that instantly me. available? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fermented. It's, uh, it's broken down. It's just like when we eat our fermented food. Do you know a guy called the world's last hope or the world's greatest hope? He's a KNF guy. He's, I haven't. He chased me down and was like, oh, feed this, feed that. He saw a deficiency in a photo. It's a typical uh, Instagram situation that we'll all have had. Uh, something I'm probably ignoring. And he's like, feed this, do this, do that. And it's, oh no, what it was, I'd snapped a branch over and he was like, oh, it's red because you haven't fed this, that and the other. And it's like, it's all there, dude. It, 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 it went out. Um, but he sort of insinuated you could rectify that straight away. And that's obviously the direct opposite of what my no-till philosophy is. It's like, patience, it's cool. But I mean, I'm guessing he, he felt he could write it, but I just didn't feel like it needed writing. Well, if it's a nutrient deficiency, uh, you could go with uh, Green Grow Space's uh, suggestion, and that's just the foliar feed, and those do but, make a pretty quick, yeah. immediate re It was like a kelp change. foliar. It was pissed off because it got snapped. That's why it was right, right, I understood that. I'm just saying, but maybe I was just telling you where his mind was at. He didn't probably know that, so he was thinking, oh, oh red stems, it's like a fucking, you know, a potassium deficiency or yeah, yeah, I think that's what, so yeah, yeah, feed this, add a load of sugar. And some people just like to play mad scientists like that. Even when you get into the organic realm, like we were just saying, like once you master the like the frugal forest build or you master your no-till bed, you can get kind of bored. And you can make it really boring too. Like there's plenty there's stuff like the teas and KNF and stuff like that that all gives you boost that can give you stuff to do every day. But you really can break it down to where you're barely watering once every couple of weeks. You know, you go in just to defoliate. It can get that. It can get that boring and simple. So my method is completely boring and simple. I don't buy anything <laughs> from the store. That's the best. I, don't try, I try not to buy anything. If I can't source it naturally in my, you know, if I have a acre lot or something, if I can't source it naturally in my lot, <clears throat> try not to use it. Really, uh, try to you know that's just basically I'm trying to keep it. I don't know. Is that my Appalachia? Uh, I don't know what, what I really want to call it. Um, just trying to keep it as natural as possible on my own little your terroir. Regenerative. My own little, my own little natural terroir. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's all trying to be as regenerative as possible. Uh, I try to work with permaculture, uh, biodiversity is my main goal. Um, you know, if I have to bring on biodiversity, but uh, I want to try to keep what it's grown in as local as possible. 
you know what I mean? I, I want to use. I shouldn't be using the word natural. I should be using the word local. I should be using the word um, like like I want it to be like the Michigan, whatever's been developed here in Michigan. Sustainable, like, right? We, we have so many. We have so many natural plants that thrive in our natural soil. <clears throat> they don't need to go to the grow store to buy a whole bunch of products for them to thrive in their natural soil. They just do it. They chop and they drop themselves, and they come back the following year. They reseed themselves and they do an excellent job at it. There's tons of minerals in our awesome clay and sand, and Michigan has, just has this great, great, great mineral system beneath our feet. Um, I want to tap into that. So, uh, you know, I'm right now I, I, I've sourced microbes, um, but once I'm able to kind of figure out how to do that naturally, also, I would rather do that through KNF and things like that. So, that's kind of a, just a learning curve, a learning process. What I do right now is I just uh, I just chop and drop everything in the ground with everything. Uh, you're sourcing your microbes every time you're doing those compost piles, Red. Yeah. So there's your local microbes right there, man. Every time you're doing that, but yeah, you could do an IMO collection right next to your compost pile. Every everything gets just scattered throughout my garden. Um, all my stems and sticks, you know, when I when I'm whenever I have anything cannabis related leftovers, you know, I my indoor crop leftovers i'm a synthetic indoor grower so if i have stems leaves biomass anything like that that goes into my outdoor um so i guess i don't know that could be different i suppose a, an additional product that i'm adding maybe that's an additive for out there uh that's not uh local um at the moment but uh you know if i were only growing out there it would only be coming from out of there so I apologize about that noise that's my uh, furnace kicking on i can't really hear so, um, indoors, I mean, I just grow in cocoa. So I grow jacks. It's, I don't know, about as sustainable as I can get growing with uh, cocoa. I'm just trying to keep a very, very low margin for my patients so that I can provide a very, very affordable product. Uh, that what do you do with your waste cocoa, dude? Quality. Can it go? My waste does, cocoa. Does it go outdoors? I, I grow vegetables out of it. Um, nice. I toss it. I have some uh, raised beds. <clears throat> Uh, I don't know. My my grade's not that big of a slope, you know, but I have a slight slope in my garden. So at the let's say the bottom of the hill is basically where I put all of that stuff. You know what I mean? So as, you know, water runs downhill. It doesn't really go into the you know no-till garden. It doesn't go into the regenerative garden. Kind of comes out of the regenerative garden and then feeds that. Um, and then if I have to, I guess I'll amend that in the future. But I'm trying to just build it high and stack it. You know, if I have to. And then uh, otherwise, in the future, I'll probably just um, pile it, compost it. I do a lot of uh, anywhere that I have uh, flower gardens. I do lots of flower gardens, lots of uh, just per I'm trying to do perennials as much as I can. So I don't really have to weed the seed as much every year. But so for cover crop, I like to have just flowers, Fla as much flowers as I can, bring in pollinators. Pollinators are my IPM. As many bees and dragonflies and, you know, just whatever else is out there, whatever little aphid eating monsters that I can attract to my garden. I'm trying to get them in there. So, what you know, I'll keep all kinds of flowers out there. I'll let my thistles grow. I'll let them flower. I won't let them seed, though. I'll pull them and then I'll aerate my lawn with that big, long carrot of a taproot. Pull out all those minerals, lay it on top. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll chop it all up. You know, every now and then if I have time, I'll, I'll make a pile of shit and I'll get out there with a machete and I'll just hand chop everything or I'll pile it up and I'll run it over with my lawnmower and I'll bag it and I'll scatter it. Or if I'm just landscaping, I'll just lay it, you know what I mean, and use it to kill grass and shit. So um, that's what I do with all my weeds. That's what I do with any anything that I don't want out there that ends up coming back naturally. But um, otherwise, uh, a lot of those old root balls, they get used for landscaping, man. I love it because... Uh, the more I run, I just grip some cardboard boxes and some like grass clippings and shit, and then some old root balls, and then boom, I have a new like flower bed. Basically, I'm not eating out of Great it. Great worm I'm food. Cannabis out of it. You know what I mean? None of that shit. Um, you know, I can use like road debris in those areas also. Like uh, you got road debris. Uh, anybody who has a house and you're cleaning the leaves and shit out of your your street, you know what I mean? Off your sidewalk or anything. You got like brake dust. There's all kinds of shit coming off of cars and stuff. You get. I don't necessarily want that in my cannabis garden. I don't know what kind of metals are going to leach into my soil. Toss in my flower beds, you know, things like that. So uh, little little ways that I use my natural surroundings and, uh, you know, I try to mimic, mimic the biological uh, nature as much as possible also, you know. So 
some flowers up high, you know, and then like uh, try to utilize as much vertical um, uh, canopy space as possible, you know. So I grow my cannabis actually within sunflowers. I grow it within, uh, uh, you know, I grow like rosemary, sage, thyme, and all that stuff along the bottom of my plants. And, uh, you know, shorter crops, stuff that's going to say small basil is a great one. I love growing basil right next to my cannabis plants. Keeps the, keeps the bugs off of cannabis. Uh, mites and shit. They don't like basil. Um, basil, rosemary, any herbs, man. I toss a ton of herbs out there, and I'm trying to get as many perennial herbs as I can. Uh, lavender, sage, uh, you know, different kinds of. Um, it's funny you say that, right? Because you could basically and, walk into a grow store and look at their pest control sprays that are natural, and you'll see in the active ingredients oh, rosemary, thyme, sage, basil. And once I found out that, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna grow and that's terroir that. as well. <laughs> All yeah. having that growing at, at root level. Do you have a specific yeah, exactly, plant that you're exactly. using? I bringing? love it, man. I love it. And then you know what? Down below that, I'd like to have oyster mushrooms and all kinds of medicinals down there too. You know what I mean? And literally use all portions. You know, the same deal with like the three sisters, right? You get corn, beans, and squash, right? I like to call it the five, the, the, like the five five man brotherhood or the five, you know, the five sisters or whatever you want to call it, where you just kind of mix sunflowers, corn, beans, squash, cannabis hemp, whatever it is, um, and they all grow very, very well together. You can throw beans down on the bottom, uh, or you can throw vining beans. Um, try to just keep the vines off your cannabis. Uh, you got squash, keep the vines off your cannabis. Um, grow on your cannabis. I mean, you can do whatever. Uh, it's just very, very difficult to manage. Um, the sunflowers, man, I actually have a plant tied to a stripped-down sunflower stalk right now. So I will check back on how it goes when I harvest. Um, so far, so good. I'm not seeing any cross molding or contamination or anything the stocks dead so far and the cannabis plant I just tied it off the other day and it's flowered up budded up so we'll see how that works out but it's all experimental man so check back so far so good with the sunflowers worst case scenario with the sunflowers is there's a lot of debris once the once the head starts the flowers start to die off if you don't take the heads you get uh you get birds and shit in there trying to take the seeds and then you literally get bird shit. You literally get uh, debris and shit flying all over the place. So harvest your sunflowers on time. Um, otherwise it's all IPM, all IPM. It's great. Works great. Prune, you said, prune leaves. You you I was going to say in stripping leaves. <laughs> you said you were attracting dragonflies, Red? What planet? I had dragonfly. Yeah, man, I got all kinds of monarchs and all kinds of awesome butterflies and dragonflies. And What plan are you using specifically to attract the dragonflies? Because, man, I have no to show idea. those guys. Mostly water. Mostly water will attract the dragonflies. Yeah, we, got, we got little ponds in our area, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just guessing that they're just there. Um, maybe it's cattails. Maybe it's lily pads. Um, I don't know, but yeah, I had a decent amount of dragonflies in the beginning of the season. It was really they cool. were hands down the best predators that I ever worked with. I got to have a, an abundance of them because I had the swamp grow, and I made it through there, and I, I harvested it today. And I tell you, my my greenhouse buds, like they look like they're indoor. There is not a mark on there. I didn't have a bit of pet, pest pressure. I only lost one plant in that greenhouse to PM. I took it down. How many times did you water, dude? <laughs> <laughs> one recharge i think in the beginning of july and i didn't water after the, Dude, after the initial tell us about these awesome. snails tell us about these snails you were talking about oh okay yeah that's uh one of the new experiments i want to do because yeah i'm into fish keeping now i i breed fish and sell uh, aquatic plants and my water is uh you know, it, it's it's got a decent amount of nutrient in it. It's not just uh, high end whatever nitrates. And I have one tank that I culture a lot of snails in it, and I I eat it heavily because one day I plan on getting a pea puffer to feed them to. But it's because of uh, Schmovit, the shipping and all that. I can't get one right now, so I have to do something with my pond snails. And uh, I'm wanting to. Put them in the wicking bed in one tent to try it out and see if they will help keep it clean and it'll just be one more layer of stuff breaking down and even if they die off those shells are full of calcium that'll eventually make it into my plants so i mean and is that glomular is that gooey stuff is that calcium in as well like a worm it's called glomular it's my favorite I, I word think, i would think so It'd be some something beneficial because like my gobies and i have uh 
other fish that actually will eat that their residue or what they leave on plants. They'll walk on They'll the plants. They'll leave like a like biofilm. It. Right. Hmm. But yeah, that's that's going to be my new experiment to the, the frugal system this, this round here or this season. And do they make you trip? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I'll send. I'll send you some. You can. Uh, you can eat them. <laughs> nah, I'll allow it. So, uh, morning glory is a, a great one that I got growing out there for attracting pollinators and stuff. Speaking of uh, making speaking you trip, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out. Morning glory is up. I've yet to even get them to seed in the last couple of years, but they grow really great. They grow awesome flowers. What's that high like? I've heard that can be a bit unpleasant. I have no idea. Never actually done no. it. I've heard the unpleasantry comes from the fact that uh, if you source them, but I don't know. I don't even want to talk about how to source them, but usually they're contaminated <laughs> seeds, you know? Um, so supposedly if you grow them yourself or if you extract it correctly or something like that, but if you just eat the seeds, there's shit in seeds that I think is unpleasant. It's not actually the chemical compounds. You know what else actually made it all summer without any water was uh the marigolds we put out there to attract predators. Like we never we never watered those damn things. We just had them in uh, some mini whatever frugal forest pots, just kind of buried into the soil a little bit, and they thrive. It's fucking, fucking cool little build. That's a good IPM one too. I actually love them. They're pretty as hell. I like them. That's awesome. I, I had one in mind that got. They got attacked. I mean, it got ate right down to the stalk. There's like this much left, and it's grown back like this big already. Now it's like, yeah, fuck you, motherfuckers. I'm coming back, and it's double, tripled in size, and it's still putting out flowers. Now. And I sprayed nothing but fucking. I just like, oh shit, you're about dying. So I just hose it off with water and just call it a fucking day. Yeah, I'm putting yeah. the damn things on the front porch. <laughs> they are. They're gorgeous for being like neglected all summer. Yeah, I've yeah. got one still going in my flower bed. I've always put them around my garden. I try to, and uh, they just seem to be hardy. I even had one in my uh, wicking bed for probably three or four cycles before I got sick of it and cut it down. Yeah, I got two of them. The best advice I got this uh, summer was from Abolish regarding um, growing aloe. He was like, treat it like shit. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to treat it like shit. I'm going to chuck it outside. That stuff's dead. Oh, man, I got an amazing load of aloe now. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that was, was, that was my problem. I had, I had an aloe plant and an uh, Easter lily, and I just kept killing it off and killing it off. And it's like, fuck it. I'm just leaving you alone, and I haven't touched them in like two months, and they're thriving. When I pick the pot up, and it's like, there is nothing here but dry, dry dirt. How are you even alive? I'm, I'm not even going to water it. Like, fuck it. But the funny thing is, then conversely, it'll piss with rain for two days until the pot is sopping wet and you think it's going to hate that because it wanted the dry. Nah, that's what it wanted now. It's, it's pretty so, yeah. Aloe has really, really shallow roots. So it doesn't really matter if it's fucking super wet or super super dry. It stores all its water in itself. You know, it sucks it up. And so what's it going to do when the frost comes? Is it going to die then? I've got to bring it in. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would bring it in for the frost. Yeah, it'll die it. quick from frost. Don't don't mess around. Yeah, because it's so yeah, wet, wet, right? Um, oh, geez, was sorry. Damn, I should bring mine in. Yeah. So like, it's like a plant that shouldn't be. A plant. Yeah, the moisture content of this, it's all water. <laughs> Ah, uh, you're muted, Green. You can't call him Green, dude. <laughs> you gotta call him something else. Oh shit, yeah. You, you're, you're still, still muted, muted though, brother. Yeah. Dude, you're muted. Mike, you're still you're yeah. muted. There, there now you're here. Mike. We'll go with Mike. That'd be good, yeah. <laughs> you're still muted, Mike. It might be your microphone. Uh, yeah, he's not muted. Maybe your yeah, your microphone's on mute or something. Yeah, there it is. There you go. You guys hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right on. I was going to say, aloe is like the plant that shouldn't be. It's like got no root system. It doesn't want any fucking light. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's you like, get water, leave me alone. That. It doesn't want that. It's like, holy fuck. It's a teenager that doesn't want to go to school in the morning, essentially. Yeah. 
I mean, all of that, all of that. You put it in the sun, it wants the shade. It just wants everything you don't give it, really. It's, it's peculiar. It's very, so for, but, for example, I, uh, I have a big aloe that I give out pups to. I gave Spartan one of them. And this one right here, this is a two-month-old pup, and it just got its first watering yesterday. So I took it out of there, <laughs> mom, whatever, and just put it in there, and it's been just sitting next to one of my fish tanks since it been born, basically. Like, they... They thrive on neglect. What yeah. did you do? You just split that off the side, yeah, and just stuck it in the bit so, of soil. No, so they come off the bottom, the little pups. Yeah. Yeah. You once they gotta... get big enough, oh. And if they have a decent gap, they'll actually shoot them out far enough for it's easy for you to get off. But yep. if they're in a small pot, you got to look in there and it'll look like it, your aloe's just, you know, real bushy, but there's actually a bunch of pups in there. Yep. Yeah. Just Google aloe pups and I'll show you what they look like and everything. But they're just like little. Protrusion. I kind of know already. Plant, yeah, you'll get you this little me, shoot really. out the bottom. Yeah. yeah and then you just I normally have been letting them just grow, but then they're the things I do tear off. But yeah, cool. Yeah. I know what you're on about. And I, it's beyond my pay grade, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but there, you want to get a specific type of aloe. There, there actually is medicinal aloe. It's, it's labeled that. That's the kind of aloe that you want to uh, use. Looks like it needs some abuse. It's yeah. <laughs> Look at that thing. That's like train really weird. I haven't seen a hollow train like that. I'm going to go find a headset and do like a dab. I'll be like five minutes, two minutes. I'll be five. So I One guess of the things I wanted to cover, and it's not going to take long, and I just think if we're going to talk about soil at all, the one thing that I think is common, and you'll hear people say, the most common thing or the most, you know, yeah, common thing that new growers do is either under or over water their plants. They don't really get into what that means when it comes to soil. Um, soil is usually be does best in, with like a constant, a consistent moisture level. But I still believe that there is value to letting um, that moisture level vary. This is just from my own testing especially with a sip style grow with the sub irrigation. And um, if I would to, I used to, when I first started with a system, I used to water it every day because uh, the way I did it was I, I made it so that you couldn't overwater. It would have a, uh, a runoff if it got too far. So I would just always water it till I got runoff and then be done for that day. And I wasn't really getting as good of results as I thought I should be. And the soil always seemed a little more saturated than what I really wanted it to be. So what I did differently was is I just started uh, looking down my feed tube to see if there was water in there. And if there was water in there, I never would water it. But if I looked down there and it was dry, then I would water it. Now, some people think, well, well, if you look down there and it's dry, well, you're letting it, the soil dry out. You shouldn't let it get dry. You're going to lose microbial populations, you know, the whole thing you're trying to concentrate on. Well, it's not really the case because when the reservoir is dry, the soil is still pretty fully saturated you know, for days. In fact, we went on a trip and uh, had a hangout here for three days. And uh, when I came back, they were still, the soil, when I put my finger in the soil, it was still, I didn't even water it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so uh, so you're, you're good when you look down there and you see that it's dry, you can put your water back in there. Also, what, I, what that does is it allows if you, if you keep it full of water there the whole time, you have less air, less oxygen down there in that system. So as the water dips down, more and more oxygen is um, available to your roots. So for those reasons, in this system that we're doing with the sub-irrigation, I think it's better to water that way. Let it get dry, let the reservoir get dry, and then refill it. Don't just keep it topped off. That's yeah. really good. It's important. Because like nine times out of 10, uh, organic systems and frugal forest systems, you need to keep some sort of moisture throughout it to keep your microbes alive, especially in like the sip build. The, the wicking with the fabric pots, there's just science still has not been able to explain how this, how ours work, where we're letting it dry out so much and then redoing it, but it works. But yeah. Root pruning.
yeah, that's what's happened. If, if you let the soil dry out to the point to where there's no moisture, um, any roots that are there are just going to dry out and die. It'll be like yeah. um, almost like a fabric pot. Well, the yeah. roots, that's what's happened. They're drying out. Which could be a good thing or a bad thing. If you're in veg, that could it doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Uh, if your roots uh, die off a little bit, it's going to um, hopefully prune them. And, and right. Split and, and make them shoot in different directions and fill that space better. But I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't let my soil get that dry. I like it to have some moisture in it. <laughs> yeah, and I like I, I've said before. I it never gets like, even if you let it sit for months. The, these these pots they don't get bone dry. If you get into the center of it, it's still got like it's cool to the touch. Like yeah, it's not gonna your hands not gonna be sobbing wet, but you can tell there's moisture there still. Like, yeah, keeping a little bit of moisture in the res is just more or less just keeping the roots on the bottom alive. You know, you got a dual root zone for a reason. Well, that's one of my. Um tweaks on the system that I don't do like um, everybody's doing or well, not everybody but a lot of people have chosen to do is the fabric sided or the fabric pots I'm like I want the plastic for a reason I want that moisture retention I want the even moisture all the way through so keep that polyology awake yeah yeah so that's that's my my theory on it or whatever my take on it it helps with the watering because like if you look in my builds like the the two smaller ones the four by two builds where the the frugal force pots are touching each other they're like smushed together it it seals it in more there's just i have to water at least half as much as i have to in the bigger builds yeah i would that yeah the ones where they're all smashed together like that they probably act more like a big full bed you know what i mean i bet your roots start crossing as well yeah, they do. They all grow into each other. I just noticed something. Porch, how come you're not smoking anything this entire show? I've smoked two joints already. I've hardly even <laughs> uh, I've seen him chiefing. He was chiefing at the beginning. Yeah, ah. we'll, like, we'll like the third one. This is actually Dan's Divine Storm. Is it nice? Shout out to Dan. That's some good stuff. It is really. Oh, really I got good. a nice branch like 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 this with some nice, grab any of that. nice lowers of that crescendo and tossed in that herb now yesterday. Yeah. On that for the weekend. Fucking joint police, though. Oh, big John. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I know. Jesus. <laughs> 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 I'm to make sure I have some in my hands at all times. <laughs> yeah, don't put you your bet. joints down, fellas. I'm not too worried Keep about it. Keep them going. <laughs> He's got the bong loaded. Uh, oh, we should shout out Dan for a second. He, he is a part of the Frugal Force. He's just, he is. OG. Uh, joined us this season so far, but... Uh, He's actually doing one of the older builds right now because he, he does Nectar for the Gods, which is like one of the, like the only bottle company that I'll ever recommend. Like I can kill yep. that, that, that bottle. And uh, he's doing that with the Wicking Beds right now, and it's really, really changing things for him. Like him and his wife can actually go out for the weekend and stuff like that from and before. Uh, you know, he had to water every day or do some kind of feeding every day. Isn't he doing a cocoa outdoor too? With it, I'm not sure. Dan's all he's got a lot of stuff going on right now. <laughs> yeah, he's doing cocoa outdoor, it's insane. That dude, and he's watering multiple times a day. Yeah, it's like <laughs> way more work than I want to do. That's all I got to say. Yeah, especially for an outdoor, that's the one thing that should be driving itself. You know what I mean? Like, you, right, are, you yeah. do not need to be involved, mother <laughs> nature, back, maybe God. water. And he's in a greenhouse, so that helps too. That makes it a little easier as far as not having to worry about weather and shit. He does it by five gallon bucket too, I'm pretty sure. Like, how's this guy not, you know, Schwarzenegger? <laughs> he might be. <laughs> I haven't seen him. Well, I saw him this weekend. He still looks pretty good. So, is uh, there anything else anybody want to hit on tonight when it comes to soil? Porch? Big jar? Um. We got enzymes. We got uh, malted barley. We got kelp meal. We got. We've covered I guess a lot one of good is stuff. Awesome. You, 
you went over the teas and the enzyme teas and stuff. Where does the like a seed sprout tea live? You know, we're starting it's to talk barley about and enzyme, enzyme based teas. Enzyme. enzyme based. Yeah. <clears throat> so barley. And, uh, I, it, it's fungal too, barley right? Be a good one. Yeah, I think uh, yes. I would say yes. Is if you're taking like if you're not straining your tea and, you, and you're taking you're putting everything in, yes the uh, actual organic material like the husks of the seeds and stuff that's going to probably be fungal right never thought of that exactly yeah Damn it. uh earlier on i want to point out something just for maybe people who were kind of like as spartan mentioned mentioned potentially yeah, harvesting imo from um reds like leaf mold pile or compost pile I don't know if you guys remember that, but really quickly, it just was the term IMO. And for those of you guys who are new, new growers who don't know what IMO is, that's just indigenous microorganisms, right? Like, and tying it back to green. So I'm going to call you green because <laughs> your name is green. Right? Your comment, you're like, that you know, is you're really what everyone kind of call me. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, I'll call you that too. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned that you really don't, you know, know much or care, or not care, but rather don't know too much about free and national, natural farming and all these other things. And I just want to point out, man, I don't think that we need to be dogmatic about any particular method. You know what I mean? Like whether it's Korean national farming, whether it's J dam, <laughs> right. Whether it's something that you've created in your own area. Uh, but you know, I mean, I think, I think that the big, the main thing is just, you're trying to lo you're trying to source things locally. Right. And you're trying to make sure that things are sustainable. And I think that that's kind of the, fundamental tie-in philosophy between all of these different like disparate methods of growing right so i just want to throw that out there man and, and when we talk about local locality uh red mentioned the three sisters the corns beans and squash and like for me i'm from ontario initially right and that's like, i'm totally familiar with that i think that's like an iroquoian cultivation technique you know what i mean i think it comes from like, the iroquoian stock initially does that make sense because you guys have iroquoian uh, natives down in michigan well no or am I am I off there? Because in you know, Ontario, it's like the Hurons primarily who are credited with like we have the blending the beans and the squash together. You know, I know that their culture kind of you know has been like it's gone both ways, right, across the borders. And I know that you know, we have an international border that separates right our two countries, but obviously that didn't exist right when they were growing corn, beans, and squash. So right. I think that there's really there's a local tie-in between the way that things are cultivated in Michigan and the way that they are in Ontario. Like very similar, like dragonfly populations, cattails, like ponds, all these things that you guys are talking about are so familiar to me, man. And it's just like, I don't know, so that's, that's it. Just use what's local to you, you know what I mean? And but yeah, yeah, that's where you're at. If you're in Ontario, I mean, yeah, we, we totally share. A, we're just across the pond, man. man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, at, I'm, I'm at, I just, just did my geography. No, no, just to clarify, I'm, I'm from Ontario. The pond. I, lived, I lived there 39 yeah. years. I'm in Vancouver, BC now. Right. Oh, okay. But you guys, like we, yeah, we're just across the pond, right? You got that whole Great Lakes system, amazing mineral action. You know what I mean? Like, and we've even got a little bit more from the Great the Canadian Shield. If you go up a little bit further, right, all that granite, potassium. So. But anyway, yeah. I it's think funny Mike. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think what Mike said was one of the most important things that's been said for ages, as far as. Um, we are all pulling in the same direction right now because of COVID. There is a lot of panel shows and people are trying to argue about who is the biggest hippie. Now, listen, we are all just trying to grow the same thing for the same reason. You don't have to be right. I mean, it's cool. And so I forgot exactly what you said, but it was beautifully rounded out. The fact that we are all trying to do the same thing in it. You know, we are all one. So just yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, he said, I, I believe I he said we don't have to be dogmatic. Yes, <laughs> I loved it. You know, sustainability. That's why I run. You know, when I grow indoors, I grow jacks, and I try not to source a ton of of inputs and things like that because I can go to the store and I can buy one. I can buy a couple of bags, and it's going to last me for a couple of years. And that's a that's not just a lot of like trips that my car doesn't need to take, but that's a lot of trips that like the demand that I put on the system doesn't need to have been for like carbon usage of like ultimate in the end. Um, you know, there's a ton of like freight tra trucks and all kinds of shit traveling. Right. So I'm trying not to put any more stress on the demand of all of that system. Right. <clears throat> so less inputs that I can try to use. So I buy just a couple bags of jacks 
that supplies my garden for a couple of years, right? Um, that's a huge demand that gets taken off of the, the supply chain, off the car, off my carbon supply, uh, carbon footprint. And then uh, if I can just sustainably grow in my space as well as I can uh, using my own local inputs, you know, again, same deal. And if I can utilize my garden to also like grow my life also, I mean, you know, maybe there's trees and I can build things off of that, right? You know what I mean? Just a way to try to uh, be sustainable and try to lessen the demand on the supply chain in my eyes. So I really appreciate, you know, having this conversation with you guys because it's important. So, mm-hmm. And that's actually, like you said, during this time, you know what I mean? Not only are we like during a, a global like pandemic time, but we're also in like a global like it's a pandemic on on a nature, it's a pandemic on like human health, it's a pandemic on a lot of things, and it's because of you know, we we are we put too much demand on the supply chain, you know, in, in a overall, you know, summary of it all. And what we're on this Topic real quick. I want to I want to touch on this because we have a lot of new uh, girl skis and force users joining us this season. And like one of the fundamental things of the force and I, I want these guys to know this because I mean with the newer seasons we have been more focused on just you know straight organics like basically one or two styles. But one of the original fundamentals of whatever of the force was is we want you guys to learn all aspects. Be open to everything. Do not paint yourself into the corner like the Jedi, which eventually got destroyed because of that. Don't be a zealot. It's we we created the frugal force because we were part of we were part of these no till groups and fully organic groups where if you did anything wrong, you were freaking you know you were chastised. You know you were casted <laughs> out. You know I have gotten so much crap over the years for using cocoa for the uh, main base in my, uh, my like, whatever, my regenerative pots, my no-till pots, whatever. And I've proven it over and over again that it works. It, it's, it's great. It's, I find it a superior replacement to peat. And yeah, it, I just used to get so much pushback on that that I was just like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go make my own group. And Eventually, I started getting like-minded people around, and you know, you guys started coming. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And before I rant too much, just yeah, keep an open mind. You know, don't paint yourself in a corner. I know so many pretty people I highly respect who, and look, no till is just a word. That just means you didn't till the soil. You don't have to get too excited. Cannabis people are not about rules, so just cool. But um, it just means you didn't till the soil. That's all it is. It's just you're leaving a fungal pathway behind. Um, I forgot what I was going to say anyway. I'd like to piggyback off of something that Red mentioned earlier about, you know, like doing his part and not, uh, uh, you know, not taking so many trips to the store and, you know, reducing your carbon footprint and this and that. I mean, Another great way to do that and like make up for those jackasses that aren't doing that (laughs) is to work with living soil, right? Because what living soil does is, I mean, I'm sure you guys know this, but maybe not everyone does, is it bio sequesters the carbon that's up there in the atmosphere. It's one of the things, maybe one of the only things, and it's right there. It's within our grasp. You know what I'm saying? Like we can pull the carbon from the air, from the atmosphere, through the combination, right? Through the process of photosynthesis, right? And, and, right, and engaging those microorganisms, right, all of a sudden now we begin pulling carbon from the air, putting it down through the roots and spewing it back into the soil, right, where it belongs. And I think that that's, like, fucking phenomenal, man. Like, and that's within our power. That's within our grasp. And we can each do that. And we can each do it by growing living organic soil. It doesn't matter what style it is. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> like, it, what matters is that we share this common ideology. Right? That's what matters, and that we love this planet because we realize that we are these tiny little microbes that's populating this planet, right? In the same way that you know those microbes that we cherish and love and brew in our tea are populating the leaf surfaces of our cannabis plant when we foliar spray it. Yeah, I know most. Yeah, people, I love that man because that that exact same respect. Like all of my, like I'd say probably I don't know sixty percent of my trash ends up going in my backyard rather than out to my curb in the front. Because it's like compo- compostable paper material and shit like that. It's food scraps is a big chunk of it too. You know what I mean? So it all ends up going into my backyard. And it all ends up feeding my garden, feeding my canvas, feeding my lungs, feeding my head. 
it's great, man. It doesn't go to feed the landfill or the anything else. The squallowing seals. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I'm just curious, Red. Do you do your neighbor, your neighbors have great lawns and gardens? Don't they? <laughs> yeah, they they yeah. do. There's there's trucks that spray all their great lawns and gardens. You know. Well, I was gonna I was gonna say like they're they're probably benefiting from your garden because your your outdoor is a perfect example of what Mike was just talking about right there. You're taking because I mean us as uh, organic or whatever regenerative guys, you know, we can help you know, fix what the, the synthetic damage or whatever out there. And you're, you're, do, you're showing a perfect example of how it works and how you're actually, like your backyard's beautiful, dude. You're improving, your backyard's better Thank than you. when you- I, I try in. talking, like when I have people stop by and I'll talk about it. My neighbors are outside. I try talking about it loud enough that they can hear, you know, we <laughs> talk about not like spraying anything or using any kind of inputs or anything like that. That way they know that, wow, this dude's got 15 fucking foot sunflowers and he doesn't fucking use any chemicals back there at all. What the fuck? Chemicals are on the ground. Not the chemicals, but the shit's in the ground, man. It's like, let's just get it out of the ground and put it into whatever potential is in that seed. You know what I mean? There's potential energy in a seed. So let's pull the, the real energy out of the ground, put it in the seed and create, you know, and then you get this giant creation. This fucking cannabis plant, or sunflowers, or sage, or whatever it is, right? You know, it's wonderful. Unfortunately, those people phoned their garden in, mate. They're not even listening to you. They don't even care about sprays. Someone else did it. No. They just no. take yeah, it man. green. Um, Home Depot. Uh, I'm sorry. Box store did it with. Uh, box store did it with. You know, X said box brand of blue yep. goo. You know, <laughs> go go green. Well, I think what the important take <laughs> the important takeaway here is is that. Um, once you learn the uh, frugal way or the organic way or whatever you want to call it, um, don't just keep it in for your cannabis. Do that outside. Right. Do it your own food. Um, the more you, the more you change. You, even if it's a small plot of land, it's that's making the world better and it makes you happier. It, it, you, you'd be surprised how proud of it you'll be, and how much it affects your mood and how much uh, you go out to check on it every day. So. Uh, yeah, I always say cannabis is a gateway to growing other plants too. So that's a <laughs> gateway to <laughs> gateway to gardening. That's for damn sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hero, <laughs> we always say hero save water here in this group, and it's really one way to save the water because, like, for example, I did the I did the kiddie pool method for uh, my vegetables this year, and my neighbors right next to me had the same amount of vegetables, if not more. Uh, plant it and they did the traditional you know in the ground watering every day watered maybe once every three weeks in there if if that if most of the time i had enough uh rain in there and i out yielded them and that's kitty pool well let's really get into it i mean like cannabis has gotten me into like more than just gardening it's gotten me into like my own health because i learned about how plants like sequester energy and minerals and all this stuff from the ground and like if you want a lush green plant and beautiful flowers and all this stuff <clears throat> you know and be healthy it's got to like have this 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 and this dialed in and this is how it works through photosynthesis and like we learn all this stuff and then it's like kind of applied it to myself and I'm like well shit I feel like shit all these days why do I feel like shit why am I malnourished or why do I have a deficiency why are my leaves yellow you know I got magnesium deficiencies or something going on right so you start figuring it out like oh if the plant is what it eats maybe we are what we eat you know I've been told that my whole life maybe it's a real and real analogy so try to figure it out and sure enough you know we are all these different things including bacteria and all these great things we have to feed wholesome you know so it's gotten me into just like wholesome just uh health being holistic you know um just from cannabis man it's been great just the microbiome just thinking of how the whole relationship between the microbiome and the soil is exactly like the microbiome in our own guts as far as how we require them we that's what's feeding us i think i heard a stat that the microbes that are in our body <clears throat> comprise more than 50 percent of our weight so there's a, it's, more, it's not as much as that, but it's about a third. A third oh, of you is, is an alien. A third of you is not okay. you. Well, yeah, it's another a organism. Water, I think. That's amazing. Love it. Amazing. Like, so you are carrying around this thing. <laughs> Sorry. And that's like in terms of weight, but I think something like 90% of all the cells that comprise you are not you. It's all the cells, right? So when you talk about cellular and then weight, it's a little bit different. But yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy to think that. Like, and, dude, you, you nailed it, man.
Spartan. That's that's exactly it for me too. It's realizing the relationship between like the telescopic and the microscopic aspect, right? Like, right. I mean, like what's happening out in space. You know what I mean? And how things are happening out in space and the astrobiology, like astrobiology, right? Like so, so the reflections and the echoes that happen right through all these different layers and tiers, like you see. It's crazy how we really are sort of, I mean, I don't want to call us parasites on this planet. <laughs> Some people will call us parasites. That's exactly but, what know, we are. I think we are. <laughs> we are. Yeah, well, we fits, are. You know. We aren't, right? But there are definitely some that we are. So, yeah. I um, that holds true, right? Um, um, so a scale and a macroscopic scale. I think that that, to Red's point, you know, is something that cannabis has really helped uh, me understand kind of on a more of a cosmological sense. Yeah, my, my mind has wandered even further than that and, and often have wa wondered if we all as just like humans individually are just but a microbe to something else. Yeah, right. On this planet, it, sure. Right. Like, yeah, like I mean, we can't live outside of our own atmosphere. I mean, it's actually pretty hard to breathe even way up high. But in the same way that you pull a particular microbe or something, a, a pest, a virus out of us, how long can it live? Certain viruses can live longer than others in the oxygen. Right. It's the same thing, right? Like, how is it not the same thing? How is this earth not alive? How is it not alive? Like, <laughs> I don't So, right? I don't know yeah, if this on, was a light on a macro scale to the whole universe, you know what I mean? Like, and so. Was this a late session even? conversation? I think I heard someone <laughs> talking about the fact <laughs> that um, the plant, um, the plant cultivates us. And then I think I heard someone say, and dogs is the same, like dogs cultivate us. Cause otherwise they wouldn't exist. Cause we kind of take them in. And, <laughs> and I think it was you read, was it like a plants and dogs cultivate us? We are the, well, the relationship you know, we're between, their sort of, between, yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. I've the, always thought plants uh, cultivate us. Plants, because, uh, Particularly the one we bring indoors and shine light on and fucking <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Agreed, and yeah, no matter what, you can make, put us, you know, we can lose our freedoms for it and still we will risk it for it. You know, dedicate but, everything. Can you think of any more of a symbiote than that? I mean, for God's I, sake, I think in its own ways it has it's sentient in many ways. That and um, fungus, and, yeah, absolutely. I think so fungus, a relationship between us. So, fungus, how interesting is it that, uh, holy shit, I'm watching a spider just climb, anyhow. Um, uh, I heard this, that there's a theory, I don't know if it's been proven, but there's a theory that when, you know, plants, obviously they, like us, came from the water because, well, Abolish can tell you about aquatic plants. They don't really have, you know, it's mostly just plant. There's not really much roots. You know, like think of kelp, you know, there you go. It's a perfect example. And they think that it evolved to f finally go onto land when the land appeared and uh, it didn't have roots at that time but it was able to feed itself through a symbiotic relationship with fungus. So plants have had a relationship with fungus for longer than they've had roots. How fucking amazing is that? <laughs> fucking that's phenomenal, man. I love that shit. <laughs> and I've heard this now. I don't know if this is true. If someone's like a mycologist or an astrobiologist out there, please tell me this is, but I've heard that certain fungal spores can potentially survive the vacuum of space. Um, sure. and I've heard this that's definitely true. So we, we think that's where it came from. We think right. it landed here on an asteroid. Fungus. Yeah. 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 So like the capacity for these fungi, because like, this fungi came here a lot. It was, it was here prior, I think, to plants, right? Is that kind of how that goes? The, the evolution of fungi, like in terms of phylogeny? Yeah. I believe so. so. Yeah, that's, that's my understanding as well. So like, and, I, and also they're like actively, actively modify their environment. Like they don't just <laughs> they just sit there and like wait for the plant to come to it, right? Like it's a it's it's as we know, right? Like those signals are man with mycorrhizal fungi, you see those different species and the way they work, it's crazy, but they really do modify um, their environment, and so that's something fascinating as fuck. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's some fungi like uh, endophytes that can affect another fungus and switch on and off whether it would be a pathogenic or, you know, a, a positive or, or negative or a neutral input to your plant. So like, for example, you could like neutralize PM or you could make it beneficial in some way right. by getting the right uh, endophyte to attack it and, and uh, change the way that, that that fungus reacts or works with the, the plant. It's fucking amazing. Shit. Yeah, like trichoderma, like trichoderma harzianum is one of those, uh, you know, a fungus that's an antifungal. 
<laughs> Egypt, yeah, <right>? yeah. <laughs> Humans are. Uh, I mean, are, are we are we not like direct descendants of fungus or incredibly I believe, closely I related? So, yeah. We're like we're two two pairs of chromosomes or one pair of chromosomes off of fungus. I mean, we're close. I think the only animal that we're closely related to chromosome wise is either horses or monkeys or something like that, but we're closer to fungus than we are even any of those. Well, it's amazing. Just that, like, no kidding. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're close. I mean, I don't know what chromosome structure has to do with DNA or like if that has to do with <laughs> bodybuilder or anything like that, what that has to do with. But yeah, I mean, I did learn that in college biology that we were, <clears throat> you know, we have like, 22 pairs of chromosomes and mushrooms have 21 or something like that horses have like 26 and monkeys have like 18 or something somewhere like that but like horses is the random one i know it was really random it's really <laughs> random. i could be off i could be off it could have been it could also be placebo like I'm, I'm just making up imagine <clears throat> you know i'm imagining uh memories or whatever it is um but i do know that i all i always thought of and recalled that whole uh significant Bit of information that I thought was really, really interesting. How closely related we well, were, and that we basically spawned out of it, out of the fungus. You know. Well, I I see your fungus, and I'm gonna raise you aliens, Red, because you're here. So <laughs> I gotta get to aliens. So this is my random, this is my random fungus facts that lead me to aliens. Here we go. So I already told you about how the fungus made that relationship with the plant, which is interesting. And then. Um, we know that fungus, like us, breathe out CO2 and breathe, or yeah, breathe out CO2 just like we breathe out CO2 and breathe in oxygen. So we're very much like them. What else in nature is like that? I'm not sure. I don't know of anything else. Um, and then we, right, we also owe, Mammalistic. we also owe, due to the stoned ape theory, our very intelligence to the mushroom. Because that's how they believe. That's what kickstarted the uh, growth of our brain. Uh, if, I would if, say. If, if, I would say. Believe... That the... uh oh, Red's froze up, but he's got yeah, frozen. A... Yeah, <laughs> he's got a crazy face. Oh yeah. Oh, I love the theory so much. Dude. I think Stone Ape is like totally the greatest. Like so. Okay, I'm 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 like the edge of creationist evolutionist, right? Like I'm a bit of. Sure, let me finish. Hold on, Red. Before you go ahead, man, let me finish yeah, my. Don't let me finish. Do. I got to get to aliens, and then then we'll get back to you. <laughs> so, you know we would. Quick. So the quick the quick rundown on the Stone Ape theory is is um, the they they can't really explain how we made the jump from. Uh, what do they say? A chimp, ape, whatever, monkey, to to man or or, Neand or Neanderthal to a human because the brain size was so different. And uh, the theory is is that uh, once we were the monkey and we're walking through the open grasslands, well, to be able to see you kind of had to stand up. But at the same time, when you're out there, you don't have a whole lot to eat. Um, so they happen upon the mushrooms ate these mushrooms for food and it changed the uh, synapses or the it spurred new growth in their in their brain as far as because they've shown especially if you mix uh was it lion's mane with psilocybin that it can actually rebuild neural pathways or new ones in your brain so they think that's what might have triggered the uh the growth and size of the brain that is crazy so, is that real is yeah look it up you can look it up it's called the stone theory <laughs> <laughs> now, one, it's a theory. Okay. Now, yeah. one last thing to tie this all together was what uh, Mike brought up was that these, they believe the fungus originally, it was seeded here. It's not from here. So it's really an alien. So really what happened was, was we ate an alien thing. So we owe everything to our existence to an alien, something outside of this world. So we indeed are the aliens. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Take it from here, right? Go ahead, Red. <laughs> well done for getting I, I mean, all the way around as well, mate. That's that. That's in the nutshell, man. That's where it's at. No, I was just gonna say that, like, um, that's the evolutionary side that I would probably agree with most. Um, <clears throat> that were it. Um, I don't know, man. I I think that I think that there's a lot of stuff that has traveled through space that's able. I mean, brine shrimp eggs. Brine shrimp eggs can survive back in space. 
they need two elements to get, I mean, they can be in the vacuum space for infinity until you give them so, uh, what is it? Hydrogen, oxygen, and sodium. They need three elements in the proper combination. Go figure, salt water, boom. Um, so once brine shrimp eggs hit the proper configuration of sodium, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, salt water that we have here on earth, then they hatch and turn into a brine shrimp. Um, who knows how long those little fuckers are flying around. Sorry, abolish. I hope that's not demonetizing us. Uh, who knows how <laughs> oh, long those guys have been flying around. Who fuck. knows how long little fuckers have been flying around in space, but they've been doing it um, probably for eons and however long that is. Um, and yeah, man, I don't know. Like <clears throat> part of me is a creationist. I think that like, who knows how, how this has all been here. Maybe we're all creatures of light and love and, whatever maybe the whole uh, hermetic text is right. something i think that's so, where the out of, out of this world comes from red i think that's where that comes from because uh this world's got a lot of uh i don't know pain and hardship i think it, we all that love and heart and why we are as humans what makes us human i think that comes from out of this world it does it supposedly comes from mars apparently in the masculine uh the masculine vibration but i don't want to get into her, the other hermetic texts nah, i believe it come, came those. from the mushroom it was seeded That's from right. the mushroom I, I like the, i like the mushroom theory a little bit better but yes. the uh yeah man uh that's all i gotta say yeah man i agree i tell you what <laughs> no you okay. go man i was, just I was say gonna it. say yes. go, go. Oh, man this lag is killing us tonight but uh, uh it's, it's not lag it's just me man okay i was just gonna say there is three things on earth that just do not make sense like aren't natural here which is us mushrooms and i think octopus too i think all three of those were all aliens we're not well, supposed to brian ship brian ship put that brian ship on the list man yep. i'm telling you dude it's uh, it came so in on a comment it was writing a comment <laughs> flying through space and we're all stardust right Carbon. We I was going to ask, does, back does, to the garden. doesn't pollen actually um, last in space, in the vacuum of space? Uh, I'm sorry, dude. I was quoting Joni Mitchell. I, I don't. Space cadet. That's a good question. I don't uh, know. So just, it was something that was just. I mean, it's usually I, stored cold, so it, obviously cold doesn't bother much, but that's really cold. I don't know. It, 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 survive re-entry too right because it's so fine there's no like well if it was like embedded in rocks somehow oh, yeah. Maybe, yeah 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 no that's what i'm thinking like it's ice and rocks yeah and then it embeds and it's fossilized probably in there and, and a bit space dust atmosphere dust and stuff like that fine partic particulate i don't know i'm just it would probably that and it would probably be reintroduced to moisture on re-entry because if it's in a big enough cluster there's going to be melt off and I don't know. I don't. I'm sure it'd be all right once it, if it's in space, but once yeah, reentry, that'd be the problem for sure. Mm. I'll tell you what. With my luck, if I had a grow going, yeah, it would make it. It would hit right into my grow, my outdoor grow. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody get seeded this year? I I didn't notice. I, anything. I, I'm looking at a seed in one of my one of my flowers, man. I was looking at it today. I'm like, I'm like, man, is that a fucking swollen cow? I got one swollen bract out there. The little fuckers nutted up, dude. It looks like it's um. Like, I don't know, dude, about the burst. You know what I mean? Like, those little fuckers totally got a seed in it. But that's one, one out of, I don't know. How many. I haven't been scoping too close on every single flower, but you see one. Still not bad compared to last year. Like, it, everybody got hit and it was like noticeable. You knew you were seeded. Yeah. I had something interesting happen, which I don't think is overly an internet topic because it could get a bit confusing. But, um, I think, well, I just think it's not, it's not going to come up a lot, but you know, I, do you remember I made that bed abolish that really thin bed and I put a load of, um, uh, put like 30 plants in it and then I fed the bed with fish and there was really hardly any soil and the thing went mad, but, yeah. um, it was amazing, but basically nope. everything came, everything came out as a boy. And I'm really sure that that's a, uh, I think that's a nitrogen thing. I think all it had was nitrogen filled water day after day. I don't think and it's like, possible. Like, I, I don't I think mean, it's like, I don't think you was, can change the sex of a, I think it's determined at the seed, man. I don't think. But he had so many in it. Didn't you have like 30 or whatever, or at least 20 of them in there? There was 36 plants, you know, in a three by three tray. Yeah. That, and, I would be, if it's not something like that, I would be really really mad at that genetics company 
Right. Have you put, were they I all? Didn't, I didn't pay for those. They were all from seed? Yeah. It was a pheno hunt. I would, I would say do the same thing with clones. I don't think you're going to change them to male. I, like I said, it's a weird one. No, it's totally weird, but I'm, I, I mean, it's statistically possible. It's fucking very unlikely, but it's, you're just super lucky, dude. I don't know what to tell you. I, I don't know if I, I don't know know if you got a lot of over there if I'd have bought a ticket or if I'd have been pissed. I right. been I've never I know heard that. of numbers like that. that. 36 males in a pheno hunt, that's legendary. Well, let's not go that far, because what actually <laughs> happened was, as I moved through, things got spartan kicked based on um, size and shape and shit like that. Because I was like, I got 36, I'm going to decide off all sorts of structure-based stuff. So things that got drowned out got fucked off early. It just happened. Whatever was left turned out to be a fucking even though they it seemed to me to show pistols and i was like here's my big male in the middle and here's my four little harem of girls that i've determined are best structure best really it was about stem rub do you know what it was mostly about flavor and um they were all boys but everything a lot before that was boys too so i might have um at least grown several mountains trying to collect some pollen and just stuck it in a baggie or something, throwing it in the freezer, just try to get some out of it. I'll be honest, I um a lot of things moved forward and I decided oh, that actually yeah. that wasn't a project that needed to be moving forward. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's real science or not, but I've heard quite a few discussions about heat uh pushing more stuff more stuff towards male. Shit like that. I don't know myself though. I've never seen such a high male turnover rate like that myself. We yeah, had crazy, crazy heat. However, what I did here, I have heard this high nitrogen thing, and I've heard this discussion before. I just think it might be above our pay grade well, to, to coin your phrase. Well, the only I'm thing gonna... that may have turned those seemingly <laughs> apparent pistols into anthers. <laughs> is some type of a stress, right? Like, to Spartan's point, yeah, I mean, the genetics are generally determined whether it's a male or a female, right? At the point of, like, embry in, the, in the embryonic stage, right? In the sea itself, actually. I think we then there's like, human error, though, really. I think we Yeah, or something. Error. It's a stress. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah, I think that it didn't turn it male. It probably just turned it more intersex, <clears throat> if anything. Yeah. Yeah, everything that showed me in the end came out full male. So there wasn't any sort of, oh, this was a Hermie thing. <laughs> like, I just got a bag of males. That's weird, too. Yeah, I mean, it is strange. It is strange to get 100% males. But, but, I mean, at the same rate, males to females pop out generally 50%-ish ish or so, right? And, fuck, you could have gotten really shit fucked, potentially. <laughs> Like, you just got, you know, when some people are like, hey, I got 10 females in this pack of seeds. You're the guy that got 10 males in this pack of seeds. Like, because someone got the 10 females, guess what you got? Right? Actually, the really weird story here is, I, th I think, uh, maybe Spartan wasn't involved. Maybe this was Jack Green's story. But what happened was Humboldt Seed Organization, Humboldt seed organization sent me four packs of seeds as testers mm -hmm. years ago. Jack had this same te test set. I, um, one set of them I didn't want, some platinum something. So I sent them to this random guy in, in uh, Canada and he bred with them. And he sent me back some seeds, which is a really cool thing. And these were those seeds. So I actually didn't, didn't pay for them and it was a total bro thing. But I also do think there's a bit here where you put 36 plants in a tray that's an inch thick. Uh, sorry, four inches thick and two and a bit inch of its clay pebbles. I do think, I don't know, there's some hormonal shit going on maybe, you know, something like that. It got a lot of kelp, that's very hormonal. It got a lot of fish, that's very nitrogen. And it a lot of roots together in a kind of, I don't know, you know. So you said it was HSO though, Humboldt Seed Organization, right? A few years ago? Was it something, was it a fem line that they were working on though? Or was it not oh, was no. It regular? No, no, no. no. Reg regular, yeah. for sure, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> hmm? <laughs> You're right. Yeah. They, they very well could have been battling each other. It's well known that, I mean, 
plants will kill off each other or whatever uh, to survive. And maybe because they were in such a packed up, you know, tight situation, they probably did start to work against each other that early on. And yeah, who knows? It's fun to theorize about that. Yeah. It's really just wild. It was more fun talking about fucking aliens, though. <laughs> Which we will get back to. That, that, well, in a later episode, we do have an episode planned with aliens and, you know, growing on growing other, in other planets. space. You know, it's, it's going to be good stuff. That was a nice little preview for that. Dude, we should do a um, composting, a whole composting episode because we've got several types of compost. What vermicompost? We've got yeah. uh, heat compost. We've got I love my fucking bokashi compost because Red was talking about using his food scraps. I bokashi compost all my cooked food waste, and it is just it's just another level. So. Oh my god, I'm getting excited I mean, about compost. Use yeah. that juice, the juice, and drink, drink the shots. Oh, compost well, is a crucial part. You of can clean your soil. drains with that, dude. <laughs> I mean, if anybody is like an expert on uh, the different types and whatnot, I mean, you can touch on that tonight if you wanted to. I don't like any kind of uh, myself. I don't like any kind of. Uh, I try to. Keep it veganic if I could. I mean, but I really don't like a uh, compost from like a dairy farm or anything like that. I want us to try and stay away from that industry. I'll put shrimp tails. I'll put crab uh, crab leg shells. I'll put um, eggshells and stuff like that as a source of calcium into my compost. Uh, otherwise, fruits, but everything. I compost just about everything. I won't compost old moldy bread uh, for whatever reason. I don't know why I don't compost that. There's a few things I don't. I don't compost old moldy liquids like spaghetti sauce or some shit like that. Um, I don't know, man. Most other stuff I usually mix mix from scratch and stuff. So I compost a lot of old. Like if you compost stuff. food scraps outdoor, just be careful of animals. Uh, yeah, rats. Right, tracking. Yeah, yeah. Tracking animals. I like food Yeah, scraps. I actually open don't open, open pile. I, You know how I, I talk about how I toss and scatter all my compost, so that's the one thing that I don't do. I have a separate compost for food scraps, and it actually has, like, wire shards across the top. Hope for an animal deterrent, whether or not it works. I don't know. Oh, we're going to see some Bokashi. So, right so that's a load of that's a load of cooked food. Oh. This food scraps. And what I do is I add this stuff, which is EM1 Bokashi brand. You sprinkle it over the top, and then out of this spigot, I'll get um, food, plant food, all throughout. And then uh, afterwards, Ooh. you take take that big slab bury it in the ground in here we put fish bones cooked meat cooked pasta anything anything as long as it isn't moldy goes in here and uh, you bury it in the ground and it'll turn into soil within one month so that's where all our food waste goes that isn't big and wet and gacky I was just going to ask you about the moisture. Do you have to add moisture or anything? We don't. And sometimes you get a really wet one and sometimes you don't. Like, let's say we've had a lot of curry or something like that. And maybe that, it, you know, but if we've had a load of pasta for a month or the seat, when it'll be different from season to season, I think. So. Do you notice a difference in the soil it makes based on your inputs? Uh, let me just try and put this crap away because it's the middle of the night. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was interested too to know uh, how exactly you were feeding it. Like, what was your ratio? Like, to the the liquid to yeah, I'm sure you're diluting right. it in water. Are you just pouring it straight in? Were you asking me? Sorry, ask again. I was saying you said you could use it. What comes out? You said you could feed your plants with. Are you are you feeding it straight in or are you diluting it in water? Okay, so I do a bunch of different stuff because I just don't panic. It's organic, man. I um, I pour it straight on the bed, on that up and down the aisles, 
and it turns totally fungal. So I get this big fucking fungal moss all over my um, uh, wood shavings. That's cool. I also mix it with a whole bucket of water in no particular dilution and pour it down my feed tube into the, the bottom of my bed. And I actually, you'll see, the, you'll see it moss up down there as well. But I just think that's great to go in the bottom there. It goes in with EM1. It's sort of an EM1. Well, it is an EM1 based thing anyway. Yeah, that's so cool. that's an antibact. Uh, uh, sorry, and anaerobic. Anaerobic. Thank you. Right. Uh, any anyhow. So um, that's how I use it, and I just feel like that's just a massive bonus because well, it just turns the nerd on me on completely because that shit used to go in a plastic bag and go in a specific green bin that goes then goes off in a truck to you know that doesn't leave my property now even even cooked food waste i keep that here and i really want everyone to do that i want to preach that because that's the one thing don't put that in landfill that's it's great so um the cool. other question was uh, what's happened so far is all i've been doing is burying it in the bottom of my um hot compost heap however one thing i did do was i had a massive um raspberry bush in a in an air pot in a big air pot and i dug a big pit put that whole slab a full one that had been cured for a month into the bottom of that hole opened that pot up dumped that in there as well oh guys that went off it just because what happens is the worms come in and just turn the whole and it took a minute but you could almost tell when it happened the worms arrived if you look online you can see this woman she does it she fills all the bottom of her pots with that gacky shit um and then just puts them on the ground the worms come to the pot and just i uh, look look that raspberry bush went mad absolutely mad even though it had been transplanted this year I know what happened. It was, it was cool shit, cool shit. Okay. So, so what cool. they actually suggest you do, and I'm I no till, so I don't till it. But what they suggest you do is put grooves in your beds, and then just put put that stuff in the grooves and bury them over. So, so you're gonna do that? When you're gonna do that? Yeah, I'll do that if that's what you want me to do. I do. Hell yeah! I want okay. It's cool. like the main. My, my ball. That's all right here. Doing it, isn't it? Uh, that's like Co a main reason. Cover it up with some of that. You got some malted barley. Throw some malted barley over top of that once you put that in, too. In so, that in that big raspberry bed. Yeah. Why the hell not? <laughs> really get that fungal mass going in there at the same time. Oh, my God. Well, right now, I've got the whole Ooh. red chop and drop thing going. I don't want to get too fucking messy. No, I okay. think it's fine. Okay. But the, this year, I'm following I'm red in. I'm, 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 I'm just... All that chop and drop is going to be gone in no time. Gone do you so think fucking fast oh dude my right. myself's gone so what? fast I, i'm a sunflower leaves gone and well, i don't even know how long but i'll go out there in a few days and shit's bare ground yeah man when the it's frost comes gone. and whatnot enzymes and yeah yeah i mean over the over the winter and then in the spring and i mean you know this next winter you're gonna get it gone um i don't know what the fuck i was just about to say my squash all died off and they're literally growing back I mean, they're flowering I mean, what oh, is I going got, on? i'm getting red tomatoes again my tomatoes stopped. They were all green and they weren't going to go red because they were frost. Yep. It got cold. And then all of a sudden, started, they just all went red all of a sudden. We had a couple warm days. Boom, boom, boom. How do I preserve um, tomato seeds, dudes? I've got some tomatoes I want to keep for next year. You can, uh, you can like use like a spaghetti strainer, like usually like a fine mesh, like a window screen style spaghetti strainer or something like that. And um, just rinse out all the, rinse out all the pulp keep the seeds dry them out in like uh i use like a paper plate or something like that you can usually scrape them off nicely you can just put them on a plate let them dry let them dry on a plate beat them with a paper towel while they're in that strainer and then uh let them dry really well and bag them up right that's know, what i was thinking do you want to know the spartan grown way of doing it just leave them in the tomato we know dudes that's the first one. That's the first way. <laughs> okay. you got that way. The second way. The second way. If I really like, it's a special tomato, and I really want to make sure, I'll just take that fucking tomato. I'll slice it, put them slices in the freezer, and you know, put them in a bag, put them in the freezer. Nice. And really, that's how it came about. It was me and my daughter. 
I'm trying to I'm trying to inoculate her. So I said, look at this. And I just pulled it out of our organic box that gets that gets delivered, sliced the tomato, put it in some soil. So it came out of a cool thing that I'd like to like keep going. So perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Same thing. So you're just, you're just preserving that slice. Yeah, wicked. Yep. Yeah, we got probably six or seven gallons of tomatoes in the freezer that we're gonna go. I'm going with my parents probably in a couple of weeks. We'll can them with my mom. So uh, we're getting towards that that end mark. I know we we started a little late. We're running a little later because of that tonight. And uh, let's say this has been an awesome episode. And it wasn't planned to be the opener but i think i'm going to take this one and we're going to launch with this one uh, because it's been it's been awesome we've got the full team as well right yeah, mike? yeah it was nice having you on tonight mike i hope you keep coming back i i think you, you fit really well here well, I appreciate it. And, uh, first of all i appreciate the invite and second of all like, this is my again first time like seeing you guys really interact and uh and also being part of it, man. And I like the energy here a lot. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's a good time. <clears throat> a lot of intelligence and then also a lot of wit, you know, and like just a good time. And I can see the angle and I'm all, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on board, man. It's a, uh, I could tell we got a lot to learn from you. No, vice versa. It's, you know, it goes both ways, right? Definitely. <clears throat> yeah. That's what the council's all about. Yeah. The leaders council but uh I, on that note do you have any shout outs or closing statements that you uh you want to do where can people find you at yeah where can we uh what you got going on now uh me <laughs> yeah is oh. my uh fan log sorry yeah no uh ooh, ew, shout outs where can people find me at how about uh just you know right now Pay attention to the Instagram channel if that's really if that's something that you do. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'm developing a course with a company called Canareps um, up in Canada. They're like highly regarded uh, in terms of like just the quality of material that they deliver. You know what I mean? Like in terms of like the passion for the plant. You know, they don't really care much about anything else except the plant itself. So we're developing a living soil at home course right now. Uh, yeah, and that's been released as well. So that's kind of what I'm working on. Uh, also, developing a course with Mount Royal University, an instructor there, and dude, I'm uh, looking to breed. Like that's what I'm doing. I've been breeding for the last six years. Like I'm not interested in releasing bullshit into the market. So as soon as I have something that's extremely unique and super powerful, you'll know about it. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Sounds good. Well, I can say is may the force be with you. And uh, let's go ahead and go around the circle. Porch Farmer. Yeah, it was a great discussion tonight. And uh, yeah, it was great to have you on, Mike. And Red and Abolished and Green and Big Jar, Spartan, Narwhal over there listening. <laughs> yeah, you guys can find me at uh, Porch Farmer on Instagram. Yeah, Narwhal's been creeping all night. He hasn't said a word. So we can just sign off. Yes, yeah, he's, he's no, there. I'm here. He's, he's there. there. He's there. Yeah. Oh. He's something, hey. dude. Just a creeping. Yep, I was just uh, sitting there in the corner absorbing all the information everybody was given. Uh, maybe next time I'll uh, have some more to contribute. But you can find me on uh, Instagram at uh, narwhalup82. Thanks for joining us, Narwhal. Yeah, I'm so Spartan. glad you were there. That's yeah. Awesome. Spartan Girl. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Mike. It was awesome talking with you today. You fit right in, man. Just like one of the guys. It was like, like I mean, just like no transition. Super easy. Awesome. I can tell we can have a lot to learn. We we are a lot of likes, so that's awesome too. <laughs> Narwhal, Narwhal, awesome to hear from you today. Didn't think I was going to. You surprised me there, buddy. <laughs> and, uh, of course, everybody else, you know, Big Jar, Porch Farmer, Red. Uh, Green, always fucking cool to talk to you too, man. It's fun. Uh, I, I, get, I love your energy, man. I fucking feed off it. You fucking put a big smile on my face. And uh, abolish, buddy, you know, lots of love for you. And all the chat that, uh, you know, I can't wait to uh, for this thing to launch so we can get chat 
you know, and get in there and, and talk to them. Right, get chat popping. <laughs> Couple more days. Uh, big jar. Big jar on IG. For, uh, good stuff, Mike. Thanks for meeting you this time. I said, you know, hopefully come back, hang out. I said, learn a lot. I said, I'm new to all this, so I'm basically just kind of sitting back, absorbing everything, and you know, and uh, just kind of learning. You know, it's been a good time. Hang out with these guys and stuff, so it's a good, good group of guys. It's been a good time hanging out. And uh, took a bunch of cuts off that Death Star today, you know, Red. So probably. I hope you did, man. If you didn't, that thing's going to overgrow your entire tent. Oh my God, man. That's <laughs> fucking huge. I probably took 20 cuts off it. I believe it, dude. <laughs> I totally believe it. It was a bush. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's fucking down there. So uh, I, I decided not to kick it either and keeping it for next year. I'm not going to grow it indoors uh, unless I do maybe a one plant project in a corner or something. But I'm going to, I think, grow a lot of it outside next year. I That's my plan. I'm, I'm putting six outside, I think. I'm already looking this year, going to probably prep the holes. Um, I'm going to take some of the dirt that I grew my tomatoes in that is just, like, fucking phenomenal. I mean, I'm still getting green active growth off my tomatoes after two after a frost here i mean and it's just amazing good fungal growth going down there and everything and all i've done is put chlorinated city water in this all year that's it <laughs> and rain tomatoes melon and squash seem to still be going it's wild yeah it's crazy so i'm thinking i'm just going to dig out some holes put a scoop of that in there cover it up with uh my grass clippings and stuff, mulch it out this year, and then next year that's where I'm gonna plant the plant the plants in. And uh before uh you get to your shout outs, right? I wanted to shout out your other show, the late sesh, because the frugal force will be joining the late sesh this uh yeah, it'll be this Monday. Let's see here, <laughs> by the time this airs, it will have been last Monday, two Mondays ago, three Mondays ago, maybe. I mean, uh, it's somewhere in there. It could, it could either this, yeah, it should be this. What, yeah, what we're lined up for this. this? The way what episode are we on? <laughs> because I like this one so much, we're going to launch with this one. So, yeah, it'll be. So, this, this is October 3rd. We're on October 3rd right now. Yep. So, yeah. today is. 10 so, yeah. I don't know what date that, <laughs> that Monday is. Is that. That would be. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that would be next Monday. That would be, that would be Monday. That's the 5th? Yep. <laughs> So wait, uh, yeah, actually Monday's like October 5th or 6th, right? It's the 5th, yeah. 5th, okay. I'll be tuning in from my truck on my cell We're a lot later <laughs> in September than I thought we were. Never mind. Shut yeah. me up. Yeah, it's, it's almost over. <laughs> it's an awesome beginning of the month because we got, uh, the, we can't forget, we got to shut out the uh, the aquaponics conference is going on the, uh, that weekend. This whole weekend too, yeah. Day. Yeah. It's not going to be something to miss. That'll be all live off uh, Steve's channel, right, Spartan? Yeah, Potent Ponics. And it's going to be all just, just he'll be live streaming from his channel the whole weekend. I think it starts Friday, maybe even. I don't, if you go to Potent Ponics on Instagram, uh, I'm sure you can see it all over his Instagram. So just scroll back a little bit. He's probably advertising it now. So I'll just scroll back a couple posts and I'm sure all the information's there. And sorry to interrupt your, uh, your shout out there, Ray. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna just shout out that late session, then shout out that episode, then and find out uh, that it was Monday the fifth. So awesome, man! Uh, no, I want to shout out everybody on the panel. Um, Jesus, man, I'm high, or else I'd read out your names, Mike, dude. It was great <laughs> having you on, man. Great vibrations from you, dude. I really dig it, man. Fantastic, fantastic Jedi to add to this force, dude. I really, really appreciate all your knowledge and uh, like Spartan said, you know, all the good energy and everything. Um, man. Dude, uh, it was a great conversation tonight, guys. We got to talk about all kinds of shit, including mushrooms and aliens and all that good fun stuff and all kinds of cannabis therapy. And uh, So to round it out, man, I want to shout out uh, Instagram, Red Setter Farm. You can find uh, my YouTube channel. There's a couple of videos on there. But check out Michigan Bros Grow Show channel uh, live. Check out their live show Sunday night, six, uh, 9 p.m. I'm going to stutter my way through the end of this, as I always do. <laughs> Cause I'm stoned by now and uh, 9 p.m. on Sunday nights, Eastern time late sesh Google force is going to be on there Monday the 5th, but check out every uh, late sesh and um, that's it. 11 p.m. Eastern Scobo and I, and Spartan's been on there quite often. So come check out Spartan growing on there. 
and uh, whoever else we have. And uh, why don't you check out Michigan Bros Grow Show, uh, the Wake and Bake with the Groskies that happens on Thursdays. Because every now and then I like to pop on there, and uh, Spartan pops on there, and whoever else pops on there. I'm also using in chat. So, uh, Narwhal, dude, it's been great to finally hear your voice again. Mm -hmm. so. Right here is where I cue in the Ace Ventura cutscene that, damn, I'm good. Like, because you are getting good at that, right? I don't even, I don't need to cover none of those base shout outs. Like, all of them. Right there. Well, I'll, I'll definitely uh, shout out my, uh, my small fabric pot supplier, Easy Swap Pots, as well. I'll cover that base too. We got to show them lots of love. They're the channel sponsor over here at Michigan uh, Girls Pro Show, you know. And the Michigan Bros yeah. Girls Show. I'll see yeah, Michigan Bros, bros, isn't it? I was hoping somebody would catch <laughs> it. Pre-warned. It's we too many pre words. I tried it a couple times, and I think I started my way through it, so I just yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and uh, last but not least, Green 13. I'm going to give a shout out to um, Sequence because we're in his uh, we're in his Zoom room and we didn't have any adverts, which was <laughs> epic. Um, you can find me Green Thirteen on Instagram, and great episode, so much fun, Mike. Everybody, I'd just love to join in. Thank you very much. And I definitely got to shout out the council here. This is sh uh, shaping up to be one hell of a season. Like the topics, the panel, it's going to be great. Thank you guys so much for coming out and sharing your, your knowledge and your experience and your wit. Like Mike said, like the, the comedy and the wit is such an important thing when it comes to teaching. And I, I appreciate that so much from you guys. And, uh, other than that, I want to shout out all the Groskis out there, the Force users. Shout out all the companies I rep for, Easy Swap Pots, Mantis Genetics, and Bad Bunny Nutrients. And other than that, may the Frugal Force be with you. Oh. I hate goodbyes. <laughs> Uh, Lloyd. Just go. Damn button. Push the goddamn button! You heard what she said.